Number three, Mitchell Sims. In March 1985, 24-year-old Mitchell Sims was having a problem with his boss at work. Sims was a manager at Domino's Pizza in West Columbia, South Carolina, and he claimed that his boss withheld some of his bonus. In revenge, Sims hatched a plan to get his boss fired. First, he would get all the other employees to quit with him. He was also going to send a letter to the head office complaining about the supervisor. He thought that when they found out that all the employees quit, they'd have to fire the supervisor and rehire everyone who quit. The first problem that Sims encountered was that only one other person quit when he did. The other person was his girlfriend, who started working at the pizzeria a month earlier. Sims was furious about the incident, and he talked about killing his former boss and blowing up the store. He even bought a gun but he didn't end up going after his boss or his former co-workers. Instead, he got a job as a delivery man for another Domino's in Hanahan, South Carolina. Over the years, Sims stewed about the incident at the last door. His hatred for Domino's also grew, and he vowed to get revenge for being slighted. On December 3rd, 1985, 10 months after quitting his job at the Domino's in West Columbia, Sims went to the Domino's where he currently worked, armed with a 25 caliber handgun. Inside the store, he found Gary Melke and Christopher Zare working. Both were enlisted in the Navy, and they were both 24. Sims gathered up as much money as he could, and then he forced the men to get on their knees. He fired one bullet into Zare's head, and he shot Melke four times in the head. Sims then drove home and went to sleep. Amazingly, Melky wasn't dead. He managed to get into his car and drove half a mile to the police station and then proceeded to crawl to the front desk. The police rushed to the pizza parlor, but they were too late to save Zare. In the hospital, Melky told the police that Sims was the shooter. The police went to arrest Sims at his home, but he was gone. Melky survived for five days in the hospital, but then he had a heart attack, and he died. By that point, Sims was long gone. He and his girlfriend, 21-year-old Ruby Paget, had fled to the other side of the country, and they were holed up in a motel in Glendale, California. Exactly a week after the double murder, Sims called a local Domino's and asked for a pizza to be delivered to the motel room. A brief time later, 21-year-old John Harrington knocked on the door of their motel room. The couple let him in the room and then forced him to get on the floor. They got his shirt off, gagged him with a washcloth, and put a pillowcase over his head. Then they hogtied him so that the rope wrapped around his neck. Sims considered shooting him, but he didn't want the noise to attract any attention. Instead, they put him in the bathtub that was full of water while he was still tied up. As he struggled underwater, the rope pulled tighter around his neck and strangled him as he was drowning. After Harrington was dead, Sims put on his employee shirt and then he and Paget drove to the restaurant in Harrington's truck. At the store, they found two employees, Corey Spiroff and Edmund Seacam. Sims forced Spiroff to open the safe, and then Sims took $2,000. When a customer came in, Sims and Spiroff went to help him. It turned out that the customer was an off-duty employee. He noticed that Spiroff was acting odd, and he didn't recognize Sims, but assumed he was from another store. Then he noticed that Sims was smoking a cigarette in the store, which was against company policy. Also, his name tag said John, but when he answered the phone, he said, Domino's Pizza, Mitch, can I help you? After the off-duty employee left, Sims and Paget tied up Spiroff and Seacam's hands behind their backs. Then they led the young men into the walk-in freezer and tied their necks to some racks. They had to stand on their tiptoes so they wouldn't asphyxiate to death. Sims and Paget then drove away 
leaving the young men tied to the racks in the freezer to asphyxiate to death when their legs gave out on them. The off-duty employee thought that the encounter at the restaurant was very strange, so he called his manager. The manager, in turn, called the police. They found Spiroff and seek him in the freezer. Luckily, they were able to free both men, and neither of them were hurt too badly. Both Sins and Paget were arrested a brief time later. Paget was found guilty of Harrington's murder, and she was sentenced to life without the chance of parole. Sims was convicted of all three murders, and he was sentenced to death in South Carolina and in California. He is currently sitting on death row in California. At his trial for the murders in Hanahan, Sims said, I am not a nice guy. You know it, and I know it. Number 2. Doris Cisneros In the early 1990s, Doris Cisneros was living in an upscale suburb of Brownsville, Texas. She lived with her husband, who was a prominent surgeon, and they had five children. Her favor was her youngest child, Christina. Dora became pregnant with Christina after her eldest son, David, was killed in 1974. He was a senior in high school and he was killed when he was thrown from a vehicle that was driven by his friend. In May 1992, Christina started dating a classmate at her private school, 17-year-old Joey Fisher. They went to prom together, but the relationship only ended up lasting a few weeks before Joey broke it off. Like many teenagers who are dumped, Christina was incredibly upset. In the first few weeks of summer, Dora called Joey several times and asked him why he broke up with Christina. She even offered him $500 a month to date Christina. Joey turned down the offer. Dora also arranged to meet Joey's father, Buddy, and she asked him why Joey had stopped dating Christina. Buddy said it was his son's business and he wanted to stay out of it. Both Buddy and Joey thought that Dora's behavior was unusual, but they thought she was harmless. As the months went on, Joey met another young woman, and he started dating her. Christina also met someone, and they were dating. Even though she was dating someone else, her friends said that they could tell she hadn't gone over Joey. On the morning of March 3, 1993, Joey was outside of his family's home washing his car before school. Suddenly, the sound of two gunshots shattered the quiet morning. Joey's mother ran outside and found Joey dead on the driveway. He had been shot in the head and the chest. Sadly, he died at the scene. He was just 18 years old. At first, the police thought that Joey might have been killed because he was either involved in drugs or he was killed because of a case of mistaken identity. Brownsville is on the Mexican border, and violence stemming from the drug trade was not exactly uncommon in the city. The police quickly learned that Joey was a straight-A student, and he was not connected to the drug trade in any way. The police decided to follow up on a piece of evidence that was found at the crime scene. It was a business card for a bail bondsman, and there was some handwriting on it. They went to the bail bondsman and asked to see recent applications. They matched the handwriting on the card to an application filled out by a man who ran a drug smuggling and car theft ring. They interviewed some men that worked for him, and one of those men was Daniel Garza. When the police interviewed him, he admitted that he was involved in the murder. He said that he had been talking to a 72-year-old fortune teller named Maria Martinez. Garza was talking to her because he was looking for ways to win back his estranged wife. Martina said she could help him, but she needed help in exchange. She wanted a young man killed and she would pay $3,000 to whoever did the job. Garza agreed to help and he found two men, Heriberto Pizana and Israel Olivares, to carry out the hit. After admitting to his part in the murder, Garza agreed to wear a wire and meet with Martinez again. 
Martinez was arrested after the meeting, and the police asked her why she wanted to kill a high school honor student. Martinez said that it wasn't her that originally ordered the hit. She said it was another one of her clients, Dora Cisneros, who wanted the young man dead. Dora started getting psychic readings for Martinez after her son died in 1978. After Christina and Joey broke up, Dora asked Martinez to use her tarot cards to see if Christina was destined to marry Joey. Martinez performed a reading and she said that it didn't seem likely that Christina and Joey would ever get back together. Knowing that they'd never be together, Dora wanted revenge on Joey for breaking her daughter's heart. First, Dora asked Martinez to put a deadly curse on him. Martinez said that she couldn't do that. Dora's next plan was to have Joey beat up. But by the winter of 1992, Dora decided she just wanted Joey dead. She asked Martinez if she knew anyone who would kill him for $3,000. She asked Garza to find a hitman, and Garza hired Olivieres and Paisana. After her confession, Martinez agreed to set up a meeting with Dora, and she would wear a wire. She called Dora and said that the killers wanted more money. The police arrested Dora shortly after she paid Martinez $500. Martinez was sentenced to 20 years in prison for her role in the murder, and she served six years. Both Dora and Garza were given life sentences. Dora spent two years in prison, and then her conviction was overturned because of a technicality. She was released from prison, she returned home, and she remained free for three years. She was retried in 1998, this time at the federal level, because calls were made to Mexico, and that's where the hitmen came from, and this made it an international conspiracy. She was again found guilty, and she was again sentenced to life. The gunman and the getaway driver, Pizana and Olivieres, fled to their native Mexico after the murder. They were never arrested for the murder, and their whereabouts are currently unknown, but it's believed that they are somewhere in Mexico. Number 1. Christopher Hightower On the evening of September 22, 1991, Christine Scriabin and her husband, Alex, were throwing a dinner party at their home in Guilford, Connecticut. As dinner was cooking, the doorbell rang. Christine opened the door to find a balding man with glasses who introduced himself as Christopher Hightower and he said he needed to talk to her about something important. She asked him to come back in a few hours after her guest had left. When Hightower returned, Christine led him to her kitchen. In over five and a half hours, Hightower told her a bizarre story. He said that he was a commodities broker, and Christine's brother, Ernest Brendel, was one of his clients. He then clarified that Ernest just wasn't his client, they were close friends as well. Hightower explained that he had taken some money from the Mafia and lost it in a bad investment. Now the Mafia wanted their money back. Until they got their money, they were going to hold on to Ernest, his wife, Alice, and their eight-year-old daughter, Elizabeth, along with Hightower's wife and their two sons. Hightower told Christine that they wanted $300,000 and he had $225,000, but he needed the rest from her. Christine thought the story was crazy. Her brother and his family lived in Barrington, which is an upper middle class suburb of Providence, Rhode Island. He was a 48 year old patent lawyer, Alice was a 49 year old librarian at Brown University, and Elizabeth was in the third grade. Christine didn't think it was very likely that they would be connected to the mob in any way. To prove to her that he was telling the truth, Hightower showed her Ernest's driver's license and two rings that belonged to Alice. He then took her outside where the Brendel's car was parked. The back seat and the trunk were covered with a disturbing amount of blood. Hightower said that they couldn't go to the police because the gangsters were watching them and they would kill all six hostages if they did. Unsure what to do, Christine photographed Hightower 
and she said she would get in contact with him. He also gave her one of his credit cards to hold on to as a gesture of his good intentions. After he left, Christine called the FBI. They went to the Brendel's home and found no one there. There were no signs of a break-in and nothing seemed disturbed. Three days later, no one had seen the family, but Hightower was spotted driving their car not far from their home. When he was pulled over, the car was still covered in blood. In the trunk of the car, the police found a crossbow, a kitchen knife, an empty bag of lye, and several human teeth. Hightower was arrested and he was questioned about the whereabouts of the family. He said he didn't know where they were because they were kidnapped by the Mafia. The story that he told to the FBI was very similar to the one that he told Christine, except this time he didn't say that his family was kidnapped. The FBI knew that his wife and sons were fine. His wife had actually just left him, and on the same day that Ernest was last seen alive, she had him served with a restraining order. Six weeks would go by, and no one heard from the family. Then someone happened across their bodies sticking out of a shallow grave in the woods behind the school less than half a mile away from their home. After the discovery of the bodies, the FBI was able to piece together the bizarre and disturbing chain of events. Hightower met Ernest Brendel in 1989 through a mutual friend and they eventually became friends. At the time, Hightower was running his own commodities firm. After Hightower and Ernest became friends, Ernest decided to give him $2,000 to invest. It wasn't long before Hightower lost all the money in one trade. Hightower then showed Ernest an account he was handling that saw a return of over 86%. This was enough evidence to convince Ernest that Hightower knew what he was doing and he gave Hightower another $15,000 to invest. As the months went on, Ernest started to realize that Hightower wasn't as good at trading as he thought he was. It turned out that Ernest was right. Hightower was a terrible broker. The account that Hightower showed him with the high return wasn't real. It was a fake account that Hightower created. On April 1st, 1991, Ernest decided to close his account with Hightower and he wanted to withdraw his money. Out of the original $15,000 investment, only $3,139 remained. Ernest was angry because legally, Hightower was supposed to contact him if the investment dropped to the 50% mark. Ernest wrote two letters and made several phone calls to Hightower, claiming he wanted at least half of his money back. Hightower simply ignored him. In July, Ernest wrote a letter of complaint to the Commodities Futures Trading Commission. In turn, they told Hightower to pay Ernest $11,851 by September 17th or he could lose his brokerage license. Hightower's problem was that he didn't have any money. He lived with his in-laws, he owed his former wife for child support, and his second marriage was falling apart. His wife left him in August and he threatened to have a hitman kill her. This led to her getting the restraining order. On September 19th, two days after he was supposed to pay Ernest back, Highsmith bought a powerful crossbow and six arrows, and he paid with a check. He then went and hid in the Brendel's garage. The next morning, Elizabeth left for school, and then Ernest drove Alice to work. Ernest then returned home and parked his car in the garage. Once he was out of the car, Hightower shot an arrow at him. The arrow went straight through his chest and into the wall behind him. This didn't kill Ernest, so Hightower kept reloading the crossbow and firing arrows at him. He ended up using five arrows, and this still didn't kill Ernest. Hightower picked up a crowbar and bashed him in the head. After killing his former friend and client, Hightower used Ernest's computer to write a letter to the Commodities Futures Trading Commission. He posed as Ernest and he said he was withdrawing his complaint. He then went and dug some graves in the woods behind the school. Afterwards, he went home and before he could change into new clothes, there was a knock at the door. 
He was a process server with a restraining order from his wife. After changing into new clothes, Hightower went to Elizabeth's school to pick her up. The school wouldn't release her to him, and they sent her to the nearby YMCA for her after-school program. He tried to pick her up from there, but the staff wouldn't release her into his custody either. Not long afterwards, the YMCA received a call from someone saying they were Ernest Brendel. He said to release Elizabeth to Hightower, and as proof that it was okay, he was going to send his driver's license with Hightower. When Hightower returned to the YMCA with Ernest's driver's license, they let Elizabeth leave with him. Later that evening, Alice got off the bus, and she was surprised to see that her husband and her daughter weren't waiting in the car for her at the bus stop. So she walked home, and when she got inside, she found Hightower there. Ernest was supposed to go to a football game with a friend the next morning, so he kept both mother and daughter alive all night. At 7 a.m., Hightower had Alice call Ernest's friend and tell him that Ernest wouldn't be able to make it to the game because of a family emergency. After the call, both Alice and Elizabeth were drugged. It's believed that Alice was strangled to death with a scarf, and sadly, Elizabeth may have been buried alive. After he buried the family, he cleaned up the garage, and then he went to visit Ernest's sister. He was then arrested three days later. Hightower never confessed to the murders. The FBI think that Hightower's motive was that he wanted revenge on Ernest because he thought that Ernest had ruined his life. If Hightower didn't have his brokerage license, then he didn't have any way to make money, which meant his wife would never come back to him. By killing him and withdrawing the letter of complaint, he'd get revenge and save his livelihood. At his trial, Ernest maintained his innocence despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary. This included the fact that he was caught driving the family's blood-soaked car with one of the murder weapons and some of the victim's teeth in the trunk. And there is the check he used to buy the crossbow. His thumbprint was also found on the print key on Ernest's computer. Of course, there was also a clear motive for why Hightower wanted Ernest dead. Amazingly, Hightower chose to testify in his own defense. He said that he had been forced by the Mafia to help them cover up the crime. He also explained that he bought the crossbow because Ernest had asked him to buy it. Ernest was having a problem with the raccoon and he wanted Hightower to kill it. Hightower said that he was at the family's home the night before Ernest was murdered to hunt the raccoon. He said he killed the raccoon left its body near the garage, and then went home. A raccoon's body wasn't found on the family's property. Then, much to the shock of the victim's families, he also claimed that Ernest, a hard-working family man, was dealing in heroin. There was absolutely no evidence to back up this claim. Hightower was found guilty, and in 1993 he was given three life sentences. Number 3 Mark Perry In July 2002, the police were called to a hotel room in Melbourne, Australia. A woman was found bloody and unconscious in one of the room's showers. She was taken to the hospital and eventually she told the police what happened. The woman was an exotic dancer from Thailand and she was called Penny in the media to protect her privacy. She had hired a male escort named Shane Chartra Abbott, and they met in a hotel room. During their meeting, Chartra Abbott told Penny that he was a 200-year-old vampire that needed to drink blood to survive. Penny told the police that he had sexually assaulted her, beat her, and bit off nearly two inches of her tongue. The police arrested Chartra Abbott and charged him with rape. He went to trial in May 2003. On the morning of the fifth day of his trial, Chartra Abbott was leaving his home with his girlfriend and her father. Suddenly, they were attacked by two men wearing masks. One of them physically assaulted the older man, and the other man shot Chartra Abbott point-blank in the chest and the head. 
the 29-year-old died as he fell to the ground. The police thought that the shooting may have stemmed from the trial. Charger Abbott specialized in sadomasochism and he saw both male and female clients. He had supposedly seen hundreds of clients and sometimes he made up to $300 a day. The police thought that one of these clients might be worried about what Chatra Abbott might say in court. The police explored that theory, but it didn't lead anywhere. Then in 2006, there was a strange twist in the case. A career criminal confessed to committing the murder. Due to suppression orders from the court, he was only identified by the alias Jack Price. Jack Price said that he learned about Chartra Abbott from a friend named Warren Shea. Shea was friends with a man named Mark Perry, who was Penny's ex-boyfriend. Shea said that Perry wanted someone to kill Chartra Abbott. Shea told Jack Price that Chartra Abbott had sexually assaulted Penny, bit chunks out of her, and left her for dead. After hearing the details of the attack, Jack Price said that he would kill Chartra Abbott for free as a favor. Jack Price said that a man named Evangelino Gusis tried to drive him to Chartra Abbott's home, but they got the wrong address. Jack Price then said he called a police officer who was a friend of his and got the correct address. They drove over to Chartra Abbott's real address and Jack Price shot him to death. After hearing the confession, the police went to interview Mark Perry, but he avoided them before finally disappearing. In 2008, Jack Price was sentenced to life in prison for shooting Chartra Abbott. In 2009, the police announced that there was an official ongoing manhunt for Mark Perry. They were sure he was still in Australia and he had just taken on a new identity. There was a reward for a million dollars for information leading to his arrest. By August 2012, Perry still hadn't been found, but the police did arrest Shea and Gooses. Eleven months later, Perry was finally found in Perth. He was arrested and extradited to Melbourne. In May 2014, the three men went to trial for murder, or they could have been alternatively found guilty of manslaughter. In the media, the case was dubbed the Vampire Gigolo Murder. In July, the jury went into deliberations and it lasted four days. The verdict was that all three men were found not guilty on all charges. They walked out of the courtroom free men. Number 2. Richard Wilson Joan McShane Mills grew up in a strict, conservative Catholic family. One of her brothers grew up to be a priest. Mills' family thought that she maintained her conservatism into adulthood. She lived in San Francisco and she was the co-owner of an apparel import business. It turned out that Mills had a much darker side that her family didn't know about. She had been married, but she got divorced, and she had kept the divorce secret from some of her siblings. She had been living with a man for several years, and they were engaged to be married. Mills also liked to party, snort cocaine, and hook up with random men she met. Whatever illusions her family had about her were completely shattered on April 30th, 1983. She was found dead in a hotel room in Los Angeles. The day before she was killed, Mills flew to Los Angeles for a business trip. After the meeting, she went out to a bar where she met Jeffrey Malloy Parker. They ended up in the hotel room together where they did cocaine, drank, and had sex. At some point, Mills stopped breathing. Parker called 911 and then started to perform CPR on Mills. Unfortunately, Parker used too much force. He broke 12 of her ribs, her heart was punctured, and some of her other organs were lacerated. There was also deep bruising on her face. Parker was arrested at the hotel 
and the police looked in his car. Inside his car was a briefcase full of bags of cocaine. After a second autopsy was performed at the behest of Mills' family, the medical examiner concluded that Mills may have been knocked out by a punch and then stopped breathing. Parker tried to perform CPR, but he didn't know what he was doing and he was too amped up from the cocaine and the adrenaline and he became overzealous. Parker ended up killing Mills when he gave her CPR. Parker was charged with murder and for possession of drugs. He was released after posting a $100,000 bail. As his preliminary hearing approached, Parker was staying at his mother's home. On the night of August 2nd, 1983, two days before his hearing, Parker was out visiting his sister and he returned home at 11.45 p.m. His mother heard two loud pops that broke the silence of the night. She went outside and feet from her door, she found her 36-year-old son dying. He had been shot twice, once in the chest and once in the head. He was pronounced dead at the hospital. The police investigated the murder and they thought it was a professional hit. One theory is that he was killed because he let the police find the drugs in his car and they were confiscated. They investigated that lead, but nothing came from it and the case went cold. Four years later, the police received an anonymous phone call. The caller said that the person who killed Parker was Richard Wilson, who was Joan McShane Mills' fiance. Mills and Richard had lived together in San Francisco. The police traced the call to the home of Robert Clinton Hale of Los Angeles. He was Richard's brother-in-law. Detectives questioned Hale, and he said that when Parker was shot, Richard was living with him. Before the murder, Richard said that he planned on killing Parker. He also showed Hale the gun he planned to use. On the night of the murder, Richard said that he was going back to San Francisco but he returned to Hale's home later that night and went directly to the shower. About a month after the murder, Richard told Hale that he was the one who killed Parker. The detectives then asked Joan McShane Mills' family about Richard Wilson. They did not have good stories to share about him. Mills' family wanted her to have a traditional Catholic funeral and Richard didn't want that. Richard was apparently very argumentative with Mills' family. He supposedly even got physical with one of her family members and he threatened to kill other family members. Many of Mills' family members had no idea that she was living with someone, so this was their first encounter with Richard Wilson. They were deeply disturbed by how he acted. They hired a bodyguard during the funeral and they were worried that Richard was going to steal Mills' body. The detectives also interviewed Richard's family. His brother Okol told a similar story to Hale. Before the murder, Okol said that he was partying with Richard. They were drinking whiskey and doing cocaine. Suddenly, Richard blurted out that he planned on killing Parker. And then after the murder, Richard bragged about killing him. Okol said that Richard told him that he hid in the bushes and waited for Parker to come home. When Parker got to his mother's porch, he shot him in the chest. Parker begged Richard not to shoot again. Richard walked out to Parker as he laid on the ground and grabbed a handful of hair. He put the gun to Parker's temple and pulled the trigger a second time. The detectives asked Hale and Okol why they didn't report Richard sooner. They both said that they weren't sure if he was telling the truth or not. A warrant was put out for Richard Wilson and he turned himself in. He went to trial in the fall of 1985. The only evidence the district attorney had against Richard was the testimony of his brother and his brother-in-law. Richard's defense lawyers painted both men as alcoholics who had emotional problems. Richard's lawyers claimed that the two men were simply lying. The jury deliberated for two days, 
and they returned with a verdict of not guilty. As he left the courtroom, Richard yelled out to the jurors and courtroom personnel, It's the last you'll see of me. Outside the courtroom, Richard Wilson told reporters that he was going to return to his home in San Francisco and marry his new fiance. Number 1. Gary Ploche In 1983, Gary Ploche of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, was separated from his wife, June, and they were planning on getting a divorce. The marriage produced four children, three boys and a girl. The three boys were enrolled in a martial arts class that was taught by 24-year-old Jeff Doucette, who was an ex-Marine. Gary and June, along with almost everyone else who met Doucette, was impressed with him. Doucette made his living by laying carpet, but his real passion was teaching karate to young boys. On February 19, 1984, Doucette went to June's home and asked her if her son Jody could come with him for 15 minutes. He wanted to show Jody some carpet that he had laid in a nearby house. June said Jody could go and didn't think much about it. At this point, Doucette was a family friend, and several sources said that June and Doucette were dating. Gary, on the other hand, no longer liked Doucette, and it wasn't because he was dating his estranged wife. Gary had heard rumors that Doucette may be inappropriately touching young boys. He told Doucette to stay away from his family. Fifteen minutes went by, and Jody didn't return home. Minutes turned to hours, and June became nervous. She called her brother, who was a sheriff's deputy, and they began looking for Doucette and Jody. Four days later, Doucette and Jody were still missing, and then June finally got in contact with Gary. Gary called the FBI. The FBI investigated Doucette's recent financial dealings and they learned that he had written a series of bad checks before he kidnapped Jody. Ten days after they disappeared, June's telephone rang. It was Doucette and Jody. The FBI traced the call to a motel in Anaheim, California, not far from Disneyland. On February 29th, the FBI raided the motel and arrested Doucette. Jody was found in the motel room, unharmed, and he was reunited with his family. Doucette said that he kidnapped Jody to try and pressure June to move out to California to be with him. It also turned out that Doucette had been sexually abusing Jody for over a year and the abuse continued in the motel room. Doucette didn't fight extradition and he was flown back to Baton Rouge on March 16, 1984. After touching down in Baton Rouge, Doucette was led through the airport by an FBI agent and two sheriff's deputies while a news crew filmed him. As they walked by some payphones, a man wearing a hat and sunglasses that was talking on one of the phones turned around, aimed a gun about three feet from Doucette's head, and fired once. Doucette fell to the ground and the shooter dropped the gun. One of the sheriff's deputies recognized the shooter because they were friends. It was Jody's father, Gary Ploche. Doucette died the next day, and Gary was charged with second-degree murder. The shooting stirred up a lot of debate, not just in Baton Rouge, but across the United States. Many people empathized with Gary and said if they were in the same position, they would have done something similar. A defense fund was set up for Gary, and the donations poured in. While many people didn't think a father should be punished for killing the child molester that not only abused his son, but several other boys as well, the district attorney's office had to prosecute the murder. Gary's actions, while understandable, were still illegal. If they didn't charge Gary, it might condone other revenge killings and encourage people to take the law into their own hands. That would be a dangerous precedent to set. The case against Gary was pretty much a slam dunk. He brought the gun with him to the airport, he had motive, 
He shot Doucette in front of three law enforcement agents while a news crew recorded it, and he was arrested seconds after it happened. Before he could go to trial, a plea deal was reached. Gary pleaded no contest to manslaughter, and he was sentenced to seven years suspended with five years probation and 300 hours of community service. For shooting a man to death, Gary didn't serve one day in prison. Gary Ploche died in October 2014 at the age of 68. Number 3. Kimberly Cunningham In August 2003, Kimberly Cunningham, who lived in Blount County, Tennessee, learned some horrible news. A teenage nephew had sexually abused both her young son and daughter. The nephew was the son of Kimberly's sister's common-law husband, Coy Hunley. Kimberly filed a police report, and apparently, the family of the young man threatened to kill her. They supposedly told her that no one would ever find her body. In retaliation, Kimberly smashed out the windows of her nephew's car. She also bought a gun and got a permit to carry it with her. Despite the fact that Kimberly filed a police report about the abuse, the nephew was not arrested or charged with any crime. A few months after learning about the abuse, Kimberly's 14-year-old daughter, Amanda, was having some behavioral problems. Kimberly asked Amanda what was going on and Amanda said that she had been sexually abused by someone else. Amanda said that five years earlier, when she was nine years old, her uncle, Coy Hunley, sexually assaulted her on two occasions. After hearing the news that not only did Hunley's son abuse her children, but he did as well, Kimberly became irate. She sent her children off to school, and then she drove over to Hunley's workplace and yelled for him to come out to the parking lot. He came out and she told him that Amanda had accused him of sexually assaulting her. Kimberly was hoping that he would deny the allegations. Instead, he laughed and said, What are you going to do about it? Kimberly pulled out her gun and fired five bullets at Hunley. He was hit multiple times and he fell to the ground. He tried crawling away from her, and as he did, Kimberly reloaded her gun and fired five more bullets. She then got into her car and calmly drove away. An ambulance arrived a short time later, but it was too late to save Hunley. He had been shot eight times, including three times in the head. 45 minutes after the shooting, Kimberly turned herself in at a police station. She was charged with first degree murder. At her trial in April 2005, she was acquitted of first degree murder and the jury was deadlocked when it came to second degree murder. The problem for the jurors was the fact that she reloaded her gun. One juror said that had she not reloaded it, she would have been acquitted. Kimberly went to trial again in October 2005 and she was found guilty of voluntary manslaughter. She was sentenced to four years in prison and that was reduced to six months on appeal. Kimberly Cunningham passed away in June 2010 at the age of 38. Number 2. Ellie Nessler In the summer of 1988, six-year-old William Nessler of Jamestown, California went to a Christian summer camp. When he returned home, his family noticed that he was acting differently. He had behavioral problems, he was having difficulty in school, and he was having nightmares. The next year, William told a family member that while he was at the camp, he was sexually abused by the dishwasher at the camp, 30-year-old Mark Daniel Driver. The police talked to the other boys who attended the camp while Driver worked there. It turned out that between 1986 and 1989, he sexually abused four other boys. When the police went to arrest Driver, they found out that he had fled the area to whereabouts unknown. Just over three years later, Driver was arrested for shoplifting in Palo Alto, California, and he was sent back to Jamestown to face the charges. 
He went to trial in the spring of 1993. During his trial, it was revealed that in 1983, Driver had been convicted of sexually abusing two boys and he served five months for the convictions. On April 2nd, William's mother, Ellie Nestler, was called to the stand to testify. Driver was shackled and he was seated beside his lawyer. As Ellie walked towards the stand, she pulled out a 25 caliber handgun and she shot Driver five times in the back of the head and the neck. She surrendered immediately. The shooting made headlines across the country and it created a lot of debate. A lot of people thought that Ellie did the right thing. They even made bumper stickers and t-shirts that read, Nice shooting, Ellie. Other people thought that by taking the laws into her own hands and killing Driver in court was an insult to the American justice system. In August 1993, Ellie went to trial using the defense of being temporarily insane. The district attorney argued that Ellie was sane and she knew exactly what she was doing when she shot Driver. The district attorney said that Ellie brought the gun to the courthouse with the sole purpose of killing Driver and this showed that she had planned the murder in advance so she was not temporarily insane. The district attorney also pointed out that Ellie was high on methamphetamines when she shot Driver. She was found not guilty of murder but she was found guilty of voluntary manslaughter. She was sentenced to 10 years in prison but that was appealed and she served only three years. Ellie sold her story for $110,000 to a television producer and in 1999 it was turned into the made-for-TV movie Judgment Day The Ellie Nestler Story. In July 2002 Ellie was arrested again. She was caught trying to buy 10,000 pills that are used to make methamphetamine. She was sentenced to six years in prison and she ended up serving four. Ellie passed away in December 2008 at the age of 56. She had been diagnosed with breast cancer in 1994. While Ellie was dealing with her legal problems and serving her prison sentence, her son William was sent to live with relatives. Starting when he was a teenager, William had 18 run-ins with the law. In 2004, William, who was 23, got into an argument with a man named David Davis over some tools. Davis called the police and in front of several officers, William attacked Davis, punching him several times. William was arrested and he was sentenced to 60 days in jail. He was released on July 25th and the first thing he did after getting out of jail was drive to the trailer where Davis lived with his wife. William, who was 6'2 and weighed 230 pounds, broke into the trailer and found Davis asleep in bed. William pulled Davis, who was much smaller than him, out of the trailer. Davis was 45 years old and he had mobility problems because of a spinal injury. He tried to run away from William, but he tripped. As Davis begged William not to hurt him, William stomped on his head. Davis died the next day in the hospital. In June 2005, William Nestler was sentenced to 25 years to life. Number 1. Maria del Carmen Garcia In 1998, Antonio Cosme, who lived in the small town of Benihuthar, Spain, was convicted of sexually assaulting Maria del Carmen Garcia's 13-year-old daughter, Veronica. He was sentenced to nine years in prison. Seven years later, on June 13, 2005, Maria was at a bus stop waiting for her bus. She was shocked when Cosme, who was 62, walked by her. He had been released from prison on a three-day parole. When he walked by Maria, he said, How is your daughter? Maria said that something in her brain snapped. She watched Cosme walk away and then enter a bar. A short time later, Maria walked into the bar. She walked up behind Cosme, who was drinking coffee. She put her hand on his shoulder and he turned around to face her. 
Maria was carrying a bottle, and when Cosme turned around, she poured some liquid out of the bottle onto him. Based on the smell, other people in the bar could immediately tell it was gasoline. Maria then lit a match and threw it on Cosme. After setting her daughter's attacker on fire, Maria ran out of the bar. Cosme was rushed to the hospital. He had burns on over 60% of his body. Maria was arrested that night. Cosme lived for 11 days before he succumbed to his injuries. Maria was originally sentenced to nine and a half years in prison, but she appealed and her sentence was reduced to five and a half years. After serving three and a half years, she was released on day parole. That meant she could leave the prison during the day, but had to spend her nights there. Maria says that she wishes that she never killed Cosme, but she also wishes that he had never sexually assaulted her daughter. Number 3. Louise Lesoy. In 1922, 21-year-old Albert van der Braas married 17-year-old Jean Lesoir in Antwerp, Belgium. Sometime after they got married, Jean gave birth to a set of twins. After the twins were born, Albert went back to the woman that the newspaper said he found amusing before his marriage. Jean was obviously upset by this. That's when Albert came up with what he thought was a brilliant plan. Albert had an identical twin brother, so he had his brother pretend to be him and he moved in with Jean. Amazingly, this scheme worked for a while. But then Jean figured out she was living with Albert's twin brother. So she took her twins and moved back in with her parents. Tragically, after she did, one of the twins died. Albert was furious and he blamed the death on his parents-in-law. He then asked for Jean to come back to him. But after everything that happened, Jean was really not interested in mending her relationship with Albert. So in 1925, Jean asked for a divorce. Albert did not take this well, so he shot 20-year-old Jean five times. She died as a result of her wounds. As Jean's father, Louis Soussard, stood over his daughter's dead body, he vowed to get revenge. Albert was arrested and he went to trial for the murder. Louis Lesoir attended the trial and each day he brought two guns and a dagger because he planned on killing the man who murdered his daughter. But he did not get the opportunity. Albert ended up being sentenced to 20 years of hard labor. There was an appeal and Albert only ended up serving seven years. When he was released, he moved to Paris, France. It wasn't long before Albert became engaged to a rich widow. They planned on getting married in June 1933. Jean's father, Louis Soussoir, traveled to Paris to look for his former son-in-law. On his sixth trip in April 1933, he learned that Albert was living in a hotel room. He waited near the entrance of the hotel for two days. Then he saw 32-year-old Albert Van de Vross step out onto the street. Louise shot him four times and Albert fell down on the street. Louise walked up and put a fifth bullet into his daughter's killer. He then went to the closest police station and turned himself in. Louise went to trial in December 1934. The judge pointed out that Albert had already been convicted and served a sentence for murdering Louise's daughter. Louise said that the only way Albert could atone for what he did was by paying with his life. He also said he fired five shots at my daughter and he has now received five from me. Justice is done. Even though Louise Lesoir admitted in court to murdering Albert Van der Vross, he was acquitted of all charges. Number 2. Jay Maynard 
When Julia Maynard's mother was a baby, she was adopted by a man named Raymond Earl Brooks. They lived in Coleman, Alabama. Julia isn't exactly sure when, but when she was really young, Brooks started sexually abusing her. It most likely started in the mid-1990s when she was around the age of four. The abuse carried on for years. She said, I don't remember when it started happening, but I know it was for a very long time. It was long enough for me to think it was completely normal. It made me to feel that he actually loves me in a different kind of way than my mother and father loves me. When Julia was eight, it came to light that Brooks had been molesting her. Brooks was arrested. In late 2002, Raymond Earl Brooks pleaded guilty to charges regarding the sexual abuse. He was sentenced to five years in prison, but he was released early in February 2005. He had only served about 27 months in prison. Julia grew up and eventually she had three children of her own, but she had never gone over the years of sexual abuse. She said she suffered daily from it and she had post-traumatic stress disorder. Julia did not think that was fair that she had to suffer every day of her life and Brooks only had to serve two years and three months in prison. On June 8, 2014, Julia, who was now about 22 years old, said something to her father, 41-year-old Jay Maynard, about Brooks. Julia had not seen Brooks in at least 12 years. Julia didn't even remember exactly what she said to her father about Brooks, but it stirred something in his mind. Apparently, what Brooks did to Julia had been festering in Jay's mind ever since he found out about it. He hated that the man stole his daughter's innocence. Jay did not think it was fair that he had abused her for about four years and had only served two years and three months of prison. So that day, Jay got on his motorcycle and he hit the highway. He knew that 59-year-old Raymond Earl Brooks lived with his parents in Berlin, Alabama. Along the way, he stopped at the Berlin Plaza Quick Stop, which has a barbecue restaurant inside of it called Mad Dog Mike's BBQ. Jay also had a stepdaughter, and at the Quick Stop, he saw his stepdaughter's ex-boyfriend. Jay thought that the man was abusive to his stepdaughter. So he pulled out his gun and fired at the young man. He missed the bullet went through a window and into the quick stop. The young man ran into the quick stop and hid. Jay calmly walked into the quick stop and demanded to know where the young man was. Mike Hayes, the owner of the barbecue restaurant, was also armed and he told Jay to leave without causing any more trouble. Jay left the quick stop and got back onto his motorcycle. He drove to Berlin and went to the home where his daughter's former abuser lived. He found 59-year-old Raymond Earl Brooks outside of his parents' home. Jay shot Brooks once and he died nearly instantly. Jay got back onto his motorcycle and drove out onto the highway. A police officer pulled him over not long afterward and he was arrested. After Jay Maynard's arrest made the news, many people in his community supported him. They thought if they were in the same position, they would have done the same thing. Many people thought he was a hero. A Facebook page was started and thousands of people joined to show their support. Also, several fundraisers were held for Jay's legal fees. Other people do not think that Jay did the right thing. This includes Mike Hayes, the man who owns Mad Dog Mike's BBQ. He called Jay a psychopathic lunatic. He pointed out that there were five or six people inside the quick stop when Jay fired into it. Mike wanted to know, would Jay still be considered a hero if he accidentally killed an innocent person? 
Nearly two and a half years after the shooting, in November 2016, 43-year-old Jay Maynard pleaded guilty to murder for killing Raymond Earl Brooks. He also pleaded guilty to attempted murder for shooting at his stepdaughter's ex-boyfriend. For the murder conviction, he was sentenced to 40 years of prison. He was given an additional 20-year sentence for the attempted murder. Both sentences are to run concurrently. Jay said he pleaded guilty so that the details of his daughter's abuse would not come out at trial. Jay's daughter, Julia, was thankful for this. She told AL.com, basically he took it so that I didn't have to relive the molestation and also be on the stand in front of a bunch of people talking about and bringing back memories of the molestation. My father was protecting me like a father should do. He is an amazing father, actually the best. He loves us so much. Jay Maynard is currently serving a sentence at the Bibb County Correctional Facility in Brent, Alabama. He'll be able to apply for parole in May 2029 when he'll be 57 years old. There is a petition to have the governor pardon Jay. Jay still has a lot of support. However, other people think he should serve his sentence. They also find the support for Jay to be troublesome. Pat Morrison, a journalist with the Los Angeles Times wrote, is an unsettling cheering section for someone who allegedly meted out a private punishment against a sex offender who had pleaded guilty and served prison time. And when an Alabama father or a California mother usurps that role, they are not heroes because vengeance is not justice. Injustice, not someone's child, becomes a victim too. Jay was ultimately trying to get revenge for what happened to his daughter Julia, so what does she feel about the situation? In 2016, after her father was sentenced, she said, I'm going through hell. Everything comes back to me as to why this has happened. I feel like it's my fault. I'm sad, but yet mad. Number 1. Andre Bamberski In the summer of 1982, 44-year-old Andre Bamberski lived in a small village outside of Toulouse, France. He was a successful accountant. He had divorced his wife, Danielle, about seven years earlier and he had just started a new relationship. On the morning of July 10th, 1982, Andre's world was shattered by a phone call from his ex-wife. Their 14-year-old daughter, Kalinka Bamberski, had been found dead in her bed that morning by her stepfather, Dieter Kombrak. When Danielle called, the cause of death was unknown, but there were no signs of homicide. It looked like the death was natural. Andre simply couldn't understand how his daughter could have died in her sleep. Kalinka was attending a French boarding school, and she spent the summers with her mother in Kronbach in Lindau, Germany. Kronbach was a respected doctor. Kalinka was a happy girl, so Andre highly doubted that she died by suicide. She was also healthy, and she skied, skated, and windsurfed. Andre knew that it was incredibly rare for an athletic and healthy teenager just to die in their sleep. Andre anxiously awaited the results of the autopsy report. The autopsy was performed two days after Klinka was found dead and Andre received the report three months later. What Andre thought was odd was that Kronbach was in the room for the autopsy and he is quoted several times in the report. This was completely against protocol. The two medical examiners noted that some fresh blood was found around the vagina and the labia had been torn. But they thought it most likely happened post-mortem. Inside the vagina was a white substance which was never tested. The medical examiners found puncture wounds on her arms, right leg and thorax. 
Brabok said that the night before Klinka died, he had given her a shot of iron cobalt. He said it was to help her tan. For some unknown reason, a toxicology test on the blood was not performed. Also, Kalinka's genitals were removed, presumably so that they could be examined later. The report said that no cause of death could be determined. The report said that forensic tests on tissue and blood samples needed to be performed. Andre Bambersky was devastated by the loss of his daughter, and initially, he wasn't suspicious that anything sinister had happened. But after reading the autopsy report, he began to wonder if Kronbach had anything to do with her death. Why else would he have been at the autopsy other than to try to cover up what he did? Andre wanted to know the results of the forensic testing on the blood and tissue samples. Andre called his ex-wife and she told him that the tests had not been performed. This only made Andre more suspicious so he asked the German authorities to look into his daughter's death. They finally did in early 1983. On the last day of Kalinka's life, she went windsurfing. She came home at about 5 p.m. and said she wasn't feeling well. The family ate at about 7.30 and then Kalinka went to bed early. But before she went to bed, Kronbach said that he gave her an injection of iron cobalt. He had a news story as to why he gave her the shot. Instead of helping her with her tanning, he said it was to help her with her anemia. Krobok said that Kalinka got up at about 10 p.m. to get a glass of water. Then he said later that night she was still awake and reading in her bedroom. She asked him to turn off her lights. Krobok said that when he found her the next morning, Rigor mortis had already set in. He said he injected her with the drugs Coramin, Novafil, and Isotopin in the hopes of reviving her, but it didn't work. A forensic expert condemned Kronbach's use of the drugs to revive her and the iron cobalt. Kronbach was a doctor, and he saw that Kalinka's body was in rigor mortis. Therefore, she had probably been dead for hours, so it was far too late to inject her with something to save her. The expert thought that Kronbach injected her with these drugs while she was still alive. She was possibly even dying or had just died when she was injected. This would suggest that Kronbach had something to do with Kalinka's death. Since Kronbach claimed he found Kalinka dead that morning, hours after she died, he possibly claimed he injected her with those drugs to cover his bases in case testing was done on the blood. As for the iron cobalt, it would have not helped with tanning and it should only be used in rare cases to treat anemia. It's dangerous to inject someone with iron cobalt after they have just eaten, which Kronbach claimed he did with Kalinka. It's dangerous because it can lead to symptoms like fever, nausea, and vomiting. In the most extreme cases, it can lead to cardiac arrest or respiratory failure. The forensic expert concluded that the injection of iron cobalt caused Kalinka to vomit in her sleep and she asphyxiated to death. Andre then became convinced that Kronbach had injected his daughter with iron cobalt and raped her. He either intentionally killed her afterward to make sure she would never tell anyone or he accidentally killed her by giving her the iron cobalt, which caused her to choke on her own vomit. Andre thought that either way, Kronbach was responsible for his daughter's death. Despite the findings, the German authorities refused to press charges. Just over a year later, Andre went to Lindau where Kronbach lived and practiced medicine and handed out pamphlets that accused Kronbach of murder. The pamphlets also accused the police and the German government of covering up the murder. Andre was arrested and charged with defaming Kronbach. Andre bonded out a return to France. He was tried in absentia and found guilty. 
He was given a huge fine, but he could avoid paying it by staying out of Germany until the statute of limitations ran out in five years. Andre pressed the French government to conduct their own investigation. They launched one in 1985. They exhumed Kalika's body and found nothing to aid in their investigation. They asked for her genitals, but they apparently have been lost and they have never been found. This made it impossible to determine if Kalinka had been raped. In 1988, the German authorities handed the tissue and blood samples over to the French authorities. Based on food particles and the respiratory tract, the experts concluded that Kalinka had asphyxiated to death. Five years later, in April 1993, in France, Dieter Kronbach was charged with voluntary homicide. It had been nearly 11 years since Kalinka died. If Kronbach was convicted, he was looking at a sentence of up to 30 years of prison. The French government requested that the German authorities arrest Kronbach and hand him over. The German government refused. So Kronbach was tried in absentia in March 1995, and he was found guilty. He was sentenced to 15 years of prison. This really had no effect on Kronbach's life. He continued to practice medicine, and he remained one of the social elite in his city. The German government was never going to extradite him, and they considered the trial in absentia to be illegal. As long as Kronbach didn't step foot on a French soil, he'd never have to serve time in a French prison. In January 1997, Dieter Kronbach was arrested. He had drugged a 16-year-old patient and raped her. The girl woke up during the rape, but she was paralyzed because of the drugs. She told her parents about the rape, and her parents went to the police. In August 1997, Kronbach was convicted of rape and he was sentenced to two years of prison. His medical license was also revoked. But since Kronbach had a good reputation in Germany, his sentence was suspended so he didn't have to spend a day in prison. After Kronbach was arrested, six women came forward and said that they had also been raped by Kronbach. They hadn't come forward sooner because they didn't think that anyone would believe them. Or they weren't exactly sure that the rape had happened because of the drugs that Kronbach had given them. After Kronbach was sentenced, he sat down for an interview with a journalist and he said he didn't rape the 16 year old girl. He claimed that she wanted to have sex with him. Also in the interview, he called Andre Bambersky crazy. In 1999, Kronbach left Lindau and moved around frequently. Andre hired a private detective to keep tabs on the man he believed killed his daughter. It turned out that despite having his medical license revoked, he continued to work as a substitute doctor. He was eventually arrested for fraud and practicing medicine without a license. After he was arrested, he was examined by two psychiatrists. They said that he was a narcissist who believed he was beyond the law. They also said he was a compulsive sexual predator who would sexually assault any patient or staff member if left unsupervised. Kronbach even admitted to the psychiatrist they had drugged and raped several women, including a 16-year-old girl. Kronbach was convicted of fraud and practicing medicine without a license, and he was sentenced to 26 months of prison. He served about 18 months. In France, along the border of Germany, is the city of Malouz. Early on the morning of October 17, 2009, the police of Malouz got a phone call. On the street, someone had found broken glasses, shoes, and blood. The police went to the area and chained to a fence outside the prosecutor's office. They found 74-year-old Dieter Kronbach. 
He was bleeding because he had suffered a blow to the head that had caused a skull fracture. Around the time that he was found, Andre Bamberski, who was in Malouze, called the police. He told them that the man chained to the fence was Dieter Kronbach, a wanted fugitive. Kronbach was taken to the hospital and then he was placed under arrest. Andre was also arrested. The police searched his hotel room and they found 19,000 euros in his safe. Close to Kronbach, the police found a phone bill belonging to a man named Anton Krasnichi. Andre was questioned by the police and he was asked if he knew Krasnichi. The police suspected that Andre hired him to kidnap Kronbach and smuggle him into France. The 19,000 euros was the payment. Andre denied knowing Krasnichi. Andre was released on bond after two days of questioning. Krasnichi and another man, Kasia Babaloni, were also arrested for the kidnapping. The German government demanded the release of Kronbach. They argued that the statute of limitations on his conviction from his trial in absentia had ended. The French government said no and they reinstated the charges against Kronbach. Dear Kronbach went to trial in October 2011, over 29 years after Kalinka Bamberski died. The defense argued that the trial shouldn't happen because Kronbach had been illegally brought into the country. They also pointed out that he was the victim of a kidnapping and an assault. Those arguments were noted but overruled. Several experts who examined Kalinka's tissue samples testified and they said she had asphyxiated to death. Other experts said that the labia had been torn before death which led to the bleeding. They also surmised that the white substance was most likely semen. Three women testified that Kronbach had drugged and raped them. The jury deliberated for several hours. They found Dear Kronbach guilty of voluntary violence leading to an unintentional death with aggravated circumstances. The conviction carried a maximum sentence of 30 years of prison. 76-year-old Dieter Kronbach was sentenced to 15 years of prison. Andre Bamberski went to trial for kidnapping in May 2014. Andre admitted to consenting to the kidnapping of Kronbach, but he claimed he was not involved in the actual kidnapping. He was found guilty of kidnapping and given a one-year suspended sentence. The men who committed the actual kidnapping, Anton Krasnichi and Kasia Bavaloni, were also convicted and sentenced to a year in prison. For Andre, it was worth it. His nearly 30-year crusade for justice was finally finished. Dear Kronbach was released in February 2020 after serving nearly nine years of prison. He was released for medical reasons. He returned to Germany to live with his daughter. Many people believe that Kalika Bamberski is not the only person Dieter Kronbach killed. In 1969, Kronbach was married to his first wife, 24-year-old Monica Hensa. Seemingly out of nowhere, Hensa fell seriously ill. She became blind, mute, and then paralyzed. Hensa was taken to the hospital. According to Hensa's mother, Kronbach pushed the doctor who was attending to her aside and then injected her with something he called snake venom. 24-year-old Maria Hensa died a short time later. Kronbach was never criminally investigated for the death of his first wife. At the time of this video, Dieter Kronbach is 86 years old. While he may not have served as much time in prison as 83-year-old Andre Bamberski would have liked, his reputation has been destroyed. Instead of being remembered as a respected doctor, he'll be remembered as a notorious serial rapist and killer.
Number three, Carl Erickson. Norman Johnson was born in June 1939. He grew up in Madison, South Dakota, and he attended Madison High School. When he attended high school, the city only had a population of about 5,000 people. Norman was a star athlete. He was the starting running back for the school's football team. He was a popular young man and he dated a cheerleader named Barbara. In 1958, the same year that Norman graduated from high school, he married Barbara. Norman went to university in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, where he played football. He earned a degree in education. He would later attain his master's. After Norman graduated, he moved back to Madison. He got a job at his former high school as an English teacher and coach. He coached track, football, and tennis. Barbara went on to have two daughters. Norman was an active member of his church. He sang in the choir and he was an usher. Norman ended up teaching and coaching for 35 years and then he retired. Norman and Barbara watched their daughters grow up. They went on to give them four grandchildren. On the night of January 31st, 2012, Norman and Barbara were at home. There was a knock at the door and Norman answered it. The man at the door asked Norman if he was Norman Johnson. Norman didn't respond right away, so the man asked him again. Norman confirmed that was his name. The man at the door pulled out a 45 caliber handgun and shot Norman twice in the face. The 72 year old grandfather died nearly instantly. Barbara found her husband of 54 years dead on the floor and she called 911. She saw an elderly white man with gray hair and a beard walking away from the doorway. Madison was not used to dealing with murders. The last one happened over a century earlier in 1906. Many of the citizens left their keys in their car when they ran errands and they didn't lock the doors of their homes. In the hours after the murder, the people in the town were on high alert. Many residents left their porch lights on to help the police in their search. Many officers who were involved in the investigation knew Norman because he had been their teacher in high school. Later that same night, the police were alerted that a man matching the description of the shooter was spotted at another home in Madison. It appeared that he was trying to break into the home. Like Norman, the homeowner was a retired teacher and coach at Madison High School. A short time later, the shooter was spotted near the home of Dick Erickson. Dick was a lawyer and he had been a city councilman in Madison. Dick was not at home when the man was spotted. Dick was interviewed and he said that he believed that his brother, 73-year-old Carl Erickson, was most likely the shooter. Dick said that Carl hated Norman Johnson because of an alleged incident that happened 50 years earlier when Carl and Norman were both students at Madison High School. Norman was a year younger than Carl. Carl did not play any sports. Instead, he was a sports manager. Supposedly, one day in the locker room, someone put a jog strap on Carl's head. This led to the boys on the team laughing at him. Dick did not know if Norman put the jog strap on his head or if he did something like laugh the hardest. Regardless of what happened, Carl hated Norman because of the situation. Even five decades later, Carl talked about how much he loathed Norman. 
Dick was not sure why his brother would have gone to the other retired teacher's home. That teacher didn't attend high school with Carl and Norman. But Dick did know why Carl came by his home. Dick explained that his brother was mentally ill and he had been threatening to kill him for years. Dick thought it was possible that, because of Carl's mental illness, that the jockstrap incident may not have happened. He could have just made it up in his head. The police investigated Carl Erickson's background. He did not have a criminal record. After graduating from Madison High School, Carl went to university in North Dakota. He then moved to Wyoming. In 1968, Carl got married and at the time of the shooting, he was still married. For 25 years, Carl worked as a federal government insurance officer. After he retired, he and his wife moved to Watertown, South Dakota. After talking to Dick, the police went to Carl's home in Watertown, which is over 60 miles from Madison. Carl admitted that he was in Madison on the day Norman was shot and he did have his gun with him. But he denied killing Norman Johnson. The police got a search warrant and inside Carl's home, they found the gun, which was determined to be the murder weapon. In May 2012, Carl Erickson pleaded guilty but mentally ill to second degree murder. He was sentenced to life in prison. At the time of this video, 82 year old Carl Erickson is incarcerated at the Jameson Annex in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Number 3 Albert Views of Jr. Prince Edward Island is Canada's smallest province. The island on the east coast is home to about 140,000 people. It's a picturesque and peaceful area famous for its potatoes and red sand beaches. It's best known as the setting for the beloved children's series Eight of Green Gables by Lucy Maud Montgomery. On November 19, 1970, Alvar Viuzo was driving on a rural road towards his home on the outskirts of Montague which is a small town on the eastern part of the island. In the van was Alfred, his wife Bernice, their nine-year-old daughter Kathy, and their two-year-old son, Alfred Jr., who went by the name Alfie. As they were driving through an intersection, a half-ton truck T-boned their van. Kathy went through the windshield. The police and an ambulance were called for. When the police officer arrived, he found Alfred walking around. He was injured and he had debris in his shoulder. Bernice was holding Alfie, the toddler. He looked around and he found the dead body of nine-year-old Kathy in the ditch. He then went to the truck and opened the door. Inside of the cab of the truck was Herb McGuigan. Herb was uninjured and he was lying on the floor of his truck. He didn't appear to understand what was going on. He asked the officer if there had been an accident. On the floor of the cab of the truck were caps from beer bottles. Herb's eyes were watery and he smelled of alcohol. Herb was arrested and he was charged with drinking and driving. Alfred Viuzo was taken to the hospital and he was released. The collision was a tragic situation. The police officer said that had either of the vehicles entered the intersection a second earlier or later, they would have never collided with each other. Kathy was buried in the cemetery beside the church that was close to the family's home. Any time they drove into town, they passed the cemetery. A trial was held in 1971 and Herb pleaded not guilty. He was convicted and he was sentenced to just nine months in jail 
and he was banned from driving for a year. The Vuzo family was deeply upset by the sentence. They thought it was way too lenient. The death of Kathy and Herb's family was incredibly hard on the family. Alfred and Bernice began to drink and they argued frequently. Alfred spent time in a psychiatric hospital. Their son, Alfie, didn't fare much better. He had problems making friends in school. He failed the first grade and he had to redo it. He failed the eighth grade twice. He ended up dropping out of school when he was 15. Alfie worked at several menial jobs like a fish plant and he was on a road crew. He rarely dated, he never got married, and he never had children. At one time, he did live with a woman, but it didn't work out. In 2011, Alby's father, Alfred, passed away. In August 2014, Alfie was finishing up a contract as a night watchman at a marina. He was a loner, he was single, and his best friend was his dog. Herb McGuigan had a son named Brent. In August 2014, Brent was 68 years old. He was a father and a grandfather. On the night of August 20th, 2014, Brent was at home with his wife, Marie. That night, their son, 39-year-old Brendan stopped off at their home. Brent had been fixing a backhoe and Brendan wanted to see how it was going. Brendan wasn't planning on staying very long. He wanted to get home to his wife and his three children. They were planning on watching a TV show together. His wife was pregnant with their fourth child. At about 9 p.m., a man entered Brett and Marie's home through an unlocked door. The McGuigans had no clue who the man was. The man pulled out a 22 caliber handgun and pumped seven bullets into 39-year-old Brendan. He then pointed the gun at Brendan's father, Brent. But then, Brendan moved again, so the man shot him once more. The man then fired five bullets in a 68-year-old Brent. After shooting both men, the man quietly walked out the door. Marie called 911 immediately. Sadly, nothing could be done for her husband and son. They were both pronounced dead. The next morning, the police received a call from a man named Jeremy Vuzo. He said that his brother, 46-year-old Alfie, had come to his home and told him he did it, he got them. Jeremy was born sometime after the accident. Jeremy explained that for years Alfie had talked about getting revenge on the McGuigan family, but no one had taken him seriously. Alfie was arrested at his home a short time later. While he was in custody, Alfie talked to a psychiatrist. He blamed the McGuigan family for ruining his life. He decided to get revenge by killing Brent McGuigan. The psychiatrist diagnosed Alfie with pervasive depressive disorder and obsessive compulsive personality disorder. The psychiatrist said that people with this combination of disorders are generally unforgiving and moralistic and tend to brood or obsess over issues. Alvy said they had not expected Brendan to be there, but decided to kill him regardless. Since the collision happened 44 years earlier, five years before Brendan was born, there was a possibility that Brendan never even knew about the accident. The McGuigan family didn't know who Alfie was. Only one member of the McGuigan family remembered having a run-in with the Vuzo family 
after the collision. That was Herb's other son, Ivan McWiggin. Ivan said that one time at a dance at the Legion Hall, Bernice, Alvy's mother, slapped him and told him that his father, Herb, was an awful person. Ivan also said that one time he had worked with Alfie's father, Alfred Sr., on a job and they had gotten along. In February 2015, Alfie Vuzo pleaded guilty to first degree murder for killing Brent and second degree murder for murdering Brendan. In April 2015, there was a sentencing hearing and it was contentious. The prosecution argued that Alfie should have to wait 50 years before he could apply for parole. Alfie testified. He slammed the nine-month sentence that Herb McGuigan received for killing his sister 44 years earlier. He said that's all her life was worth. She only had nine years in this world and nobody cared. It's haunted me all my life. Marie, who was Brent's wife and Brendan's mother, testified. She said, I feel so much anger and hatred that it scares me. I hate that they died this way and it haunts me. Marie was allowed to directly address Alfie. She asked him why he didn't kill her. Alfie told her that was because she was a woman. After this comment, Brent's second son and Brendan's brother, Alan, said, I won't go easy on your mother, bud. There won't be a Vuzo left alive in Montague, sucker. Alvy responded, I'll remember that. Alan was promptly kicked out of the courtroom for the comment. Alfie ended up being given two life sentences without the chance of parole until he served 35 years. That means he'll be able to apply for parole for the first time when he's 81 years old. After Alfie was sentenced, he flipped out. At the family of his victims, he shouted, You sentenced me to life, and I set them to death. As he was being led out of the courtroom, he screamed, You guys, at the McGuigans. The murders had devastating effects on both the McGuigan and Vuzo families. Brendan's wife gave birth to their fourth child four months after he was murdered. She ended up selling their home and moving away from the area because she thought that the house was too lonely without Brandon. Alvy's mother also sold her home and moved away. The double murder is considered one of the most notorious homicides in the history of Prince Edward Island. Number 1. Anthony Garcia William and Claire Hunter lived in an upscale neighborhood in Omaha, Nebraska. William and Claire were doctors and they worked at the Creighton University Medical Center. Claire was a cardiologist and William was the head of the pathology residency program. The couple had four sons. On March 13, 2008, Claire was out of town at a conference. William finished work at around 5 p.m. and then he drove home. When William arrived home, he noticed something odd. The car belonging to their housekeeper, Shirley Sherman, was parked in the driveway. She was usually gone by the time he arrived home. Nevertheless, William walked in the back door of the house. A few steps from the door, he found the dead body of 57-year-old Shirley Sherman. Her body was in a pool of blood and a knife was embedded in her neck. It was clear that she was dead. In a panic, William searched the rest of the house. His youngest son, 11-year-old Thomas, was the only one who still lived at home. He was eight years younger than his next oldest sibling. On the dining room floor, William found the dead body of his 11-year-old son, Thomas. 
Like Sherman, there was a knife embedded in his neck. It was later determined that Sherman had been stabbed 17 times before the knife was left in her neck. Thomas had also been stabbed multiple times. The stab wounds on both victims were in small clusters on the right side of their necks below the ear and jawline. It appeared that the killer was trying to cut or stab their jugular vein or carotid artery. Both knives came from the family's kitchen. It's believed that when Thomas got home, he went into the basement to play video games. The killer came to the front door and Thomas let him in. The killer made his way to the kitchen and picked up the knives. Thomas most likely ran and the killer tackled him in the dining room. He then proceeded to stab him. Shirley Sherman was upstairs cleaning when this happened. She may have heard the noises of the attack and came downstairs to investigate. She most likely saw the killer, possibly in the process of murdering Thomas, so she ran towards the back door. The killer chased her and tackled her and then stabbed her to death. The police had no idea who would want to kill the 11-year-old 6th grader and the family's housekeeper. Nothing had been stolen from the home and neither victim had been sexually assaulted. Thomas was a bright young man who attended a magnet school for science and technology. He loved video games and books. He wasn't involved in any dangerous behavior like gangs or drugs. Shirley Sherman had a former boyfriend who was abusive, but he was cleared as a suspect. Several people saw a silver Honda CRV near the crime scene. The police followed up on this lead, but it did not go anywhere. The detectives working on the case asked the FBI for assistance. They suggested it could have been the work of a serial killing drifter and the murders were just random. It wasn't long before the case went cold. On the morning of May 14, 2014, the police were called to another upscale home in Omaha. It had been over five years since Thomas Hunter and Shirley Sherman were killed. Some piano movers had found the bodies of Roger and Mary Brumbach, who were both 65. The Brumbachs were packing up to move to a different state. Roger was just a few weeks away from retirement. He was the head of pathology at the Crane University Medical Center. He was the colleague of Thomas Hunter's father, William. The couple had been murdered two days earlier on Mother's Day. It's believed that Roger opened the door to the killer who was armed with a gun. Roger and the killer struggled with the gun and the killer managed to fire off four shots. Roger was hit three times. One of the bullets which entered his abdomen was fatal. After the four shots were fired, the clip fell out of the gun. It's believed that Mary was drawn to the front door by the sounds of the attack. The killer then proceeded to pistol whip Mary until the gun broke. Then the killer went into the kitchen and grabbed two knives. He returned and Mary fought off the attacker the best she could. There were 20 defensive wounds on her hands and arms. She was stabbed six times on the right side of the neck. One of the stabs cut her carotid artery. The killer then walked over to Roger and stabbed him six times on the right side of the neck. He left both knives on the floor. Nothing was stolen from the home and there were no signs of sexual assault. The police immediately thought that the sets of murders were connected. 
Both had been double murders, and all four victims were stabbed in the right side of the neck. They also had connections to the Crane University Medical Center. Specifically, Roger was a member of the pathology department, as was Thomas's father, William. The murders of the Brungbacks made it clear that it wasn't some serial killer choosing victims at random. Instead, the killer appeared to be targeting members of the pathology department. Hours after the Brungbacks' bodies were found, the police learned something that confirmed that theory. Another doctor who worked in the pathology department told the police that on the same day the Brungbacks were killed, someone tried to break into her home. No one was home at the time, and she thought that the security alarm scared them off. The crimes made no sense to the investigators. Why would someone want to hurt the members of the Crane University Medical Center's pathology department? Pathologists examined dead bodies. So it's not like one of them botched some procedure or surgery that killed someone's loved one or something of that nature. The police began to suspect that the killer had medical training. They thought that the killer's stabbing method was methodical. He seemed to be aiming for the jugular vein or the carotid artery. If they were cut, it would be fatal in under a minute. The police did not find the killer's fingerprints at either crime scene. So the police thought that the killer may have worn medical gloves. After the murders of the Brungbacks, a task force was formed and the FBI became heavily involved in the investigation. The investigators started going through the medical center's personnel files. In the personnel files, they found a possible suspect, 40-year-old Anthony Garcia. Garcia had been a resident in 2000, 13 years before the Brungbacks were killed. Garcia had a lot of problems in the program. He was considered immature, defiant, and for someone who went to medical school, he had a surprising lack of knowledge. He never took responsibility for his actions, and his problems were always caused by someone else. The final straw was a prank that Garcia pulled. While the chief resident was taking an exam, Garcia had another student call the chief resident's wife. He told the chief resident's wife that her husband was needed at the medical center right away or he'd be fired. William Hunter and Roger Brungback considered the prank harassment, so Garcia was dismissed from the program. He was just 11 months into the four-year program. Garcia's termination letter was signed by William Hunter and Roger Brungback. The police then looked into Garcia's background. He had a criminal record for driving under the influence, but that was it. What caught the attention of the investigators was that Garcia owned a silver Honda CRV when Thomas Hunter and Shirley Sherman were killed. It turned out that being dismissed from the program had caused a lot of problems for Garcia. Whenever Garcia applied for jobs in the medical field, he was always asked if he had been fired from a residency program or discipline in a residency program. He would respond yes, and then he wouldn't get the job. Or he would lie, then get the job, only to be fired later. In February 2008, Anthony was fired from Louisiana State University for omitting that he had been fired from Creighton. Two weeks later, Thomas Hunter and Shirley Sherman were stabbed to death. In December 2012, about five months before the Brungbacks were killed, Garcia was denied a medical license from the Indiana Licensing Board. The police concluded that Anthony Garcia was seeking revenge on the people who fired him in 2001, seven years before the first murders were committed. The investigators needed to prove that Garcia was in Omaha on the day that either set of murders happened. 
The police thought that since there were so many similarities between the murders, that was clear that one person committed them. When the first murders were committed, Garcia was living in Shreveport, Louisiana. When the Brungbacks were killed, he was living in Terre Haute, Indiana. The investigators got a hold of Garcia's phone records. It turned out his phone was used near Omaha on the day the Brumbacks were killed. They also got Garcia's financial records. Two months before the Brumbacks were killed, Garcia purchased the same olive gun used to shoot Roger with his credit card. They also found out that Garcia's credit cards were used to make several purchases in Omaha on the day the Brumbacks were murdered. One purchase was made at a convenience store, and another one was made at a restaurant. The restaurant was just a few blocks from the Brungbacks' house. The investigators went to the convenience store, and they got the surveillance footage from that day. Garcia was recorded on tape at the store. This proved Garcia was in Omaha, and he could claim that someone stole his credit card and phone. On July 15, 2013, 40-year-old Anthony Garcia was arrested. Garcia went to trial three years later in October 2016. After a three-week trial, the jury deliberated for six hours over two days. Garcia was convicted of four counts of first-degree murder. In the lead-up to his trial, Garcia didn't talk to his lawyers or his family. At a sentencing hearing in September 2018, he sat in his wheelchair and either slept or pretended to sleep. He was sentenced to death. 47-year-old Anthony Garcia is sitting on death row at the Tecumseh State Correctional Institution in Tecumseh, Nebraska. No execution date has been set. Number 3. Lois Nadine Smith In 1982, 41-year-old Lois Smith lived in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. She went by her middle name, Nadine. In high school, she gained the nickname Mean Nadine because of her short temper and the nickname stuck with her for the rest of her life. In 1982, she had a job as the assistant supervisor of secretaries and bookkeepers at a local company. She had four children and a stepson. Although Nadine was known for her short temper, which got worse when drugs and alcohol were involved, she did not have a criminal record. One person who seemed immune from her temper was her son Greg. In 1982, Greg was 18 years old and he was dealing drugs. Nadine didn't seem to mind that her son was involved in illegal activity. Earlier that year, Greg had been dating a 21-year-old woman named Cindy Bailey. But, at some point, they had broken up. At the beginning of July 1982, Greg was dating another young woman, Teresa Baker. Nadine had been hearing rumors that Cindy was going to talk to the police about Greg's drug dealing. She also heard rumors that Nadine was arranging to have Greg killed. Being the protective mother, Nadine decided to get some revenge on the woman who was threatening her son. On the morning of July 4th, 1982, Nadine, Greg, and Greg's current girlfriend, Teresa Baker, went over to the motel where Cindy was staying. Nadine and Greg convinced Cindy that she should come with them for a drive. Before they got out to the parking lot, Teresa told Cindy not to get into the car. But Cindy ignored her and got into the vehicle's back seat with Nadine. Within minutes of getting into the car, Nadine confronted Cindy about the rumors, and she denied it. Nadine then started to strangle Cindy. Then Greg, who was driving, passed his mother a knife. Nadine slowly drove the knife into Cindy's neck near the oral cavity. Nadine directed Greg to drive to his father's home. Nadine and her ex-husband Jim had been divorced for years. He lived in Gaines, Oklahoma. 
When they got there, Nadine pointed a gun in her ex-husband's face, forced him to get into the bathroom, and told him to stay there. Jim did as he was ordered. Nadine, Greg, and Teresa took Cindy into the living room. Nadine taunted Cindy by pointing the gun at different parts of her body. Cindy would move a pillow in vain attempts to block the bullet. While Cindy was sitting on a recliner, Nadine fired a shot and the bullet almost hit Cindy in the head. She then fired several shots at Cindy and this caused Cindy to fall to the floor. Nadine handed the empty gun to Greg and then he and Teresa left the room to reload it. When they returned, Nadine was standing on Cindy's neck. She then jumped up and down several times on her neck. Greg handed the gun back to his mother and told her to finish her off. Nadine then fired five bullets into the body of 21-year-old Cindy Bailey. After killing the young woman, Nadine, Greg, and Teresa left. A short time later, a neighbor came over to Jim Smith's home and found the body. They called the police. Half an hour later, Nadine, Greg, and Teresa were arrested. The medical examiner determined that Cindy had been shot eight times, five in the chest, twice in the head, and once in the back. Five of the shots would have been fatal. The stab wound to the neck could have been fatal as well. Teresa told the police what happened, and in exchange for immunity, she agreed to testify against the mother and son. Lois Nadine Smith went to trial in December 1982. She was found guilty and she was sentenced to death. Greg Smith went to trial in June 1983. He was also found guilty and he was sentenced to life in prison. Nadine served 19 years on death row. On December 4, 2001, 61-year-old Lois Nadine Smith was executed via lethal injection. Her last words were, To the families, I want to say I'm sorry for the pain and loss I've caused you. I ask that you forgive me. You must forgive to be forgiven. Nadine is only one of 17 women who have been executed in the United States since the death penalty was reinstated in 1976. Gregory Smith was released on parole in January 2009 after serving 27 years. But a few months later, he was sent back to prison for possession of marijuana. He was released in April 2011 after serving about two more years. In September 2013, he stabbed a man in Bozeman, Montana. He was also accused of beating and keeping a woman captive in his hotel room for two months. Instead of sending him to trial for those crimes, he was sent back to Oklahoma to keep serving his life sentence. At the time of this video, 57-year-old Gregory Smith is serving a sentence at the Law and Correctional Facility in Law in Oklahoma. Number 2. The Bride of Christ Church It's believed that Franz Edmund Kreffield was born in Germany around 1873. He came to the United States around 1884. As an adult, he was a member of the Salvation Army for a short time. He then decided to leave the Salvation Army and became a traveling street preacher, trying to attract a following. Franz named his group the Bride of Christ Church and he called himself Joshua II. In July 1902, Franz was in Portland, Oregon, and he met a woman named Maud Hurt, who would later become his follower and his wife. In late 1902, Franz and his followers settled in Corvallis, Oregon, a town with a population of about 2,500 people. Franz's flock continued to grow in the town, but not everyone was impressed with the church's presence. Many of the townspeople thought that they were a cult, and they called them Holy Rollers because of their frenzied style of worship. At most, the cult had 27 people, and many of them were from one family, the Hertz. Eventually, the cult lived in the Hertz home. 
On October 28, 1903, in an act of anti-materialism, Franz had his followers take the Hertz possessions out to their front yard and set them on fire. The bonfire lasted for three days. People in the town began to wonder if Franz was being proper with all the female followers. In January 1904, a group of men tarred and feathered Franz and told him to leave town. The next day, he married Maud Hurt. Franz and his followers then left town. Franz and some of his followers ended up in Portland, Oregon. It was there that Franz had a sexual affair with his wife's aunt, Donna Starr. On March 16, 1904, Donna told her husband, Burgess, about the affair. At the time, adultery was illegal in Oregon, so a warrant was issued for Franz's arrest. But the police couldn't find him. They looked for months, and during that time, many of his followers were committed to asylums. In July 1904, Franz was found in the home of his mother-in-law. He went to trial the next month. Donna Starr testified against him. The jury deliberated for 25 minutes. They found him guilty and he was sentenced to a maximum of two years in prison. He ended up serving 17 months in prison. Upon his release, he started going by the name Elijah. He claimed he was Jesus, he had risen from the dead. By the time he was released, many of his followers had also been released. He told his followers they placed a curse on the Sodoms of Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, and Corvallis. A few days after he said he made the curse, on April 18, 1906, there was a massive earthquake in San Francisco. 80% of the city was destroyed and over 3,000 people were killed. The earthquake further convinced Franz's followers that he was the true prophet. One of his most hardcore followers was Esther Mitchell. She was just 15 years old when she joined the cult. She was first cousins with Franz's wife, Maud, and she was the sister of Donna Starr. In the spring of 1906, when Franz was released from prison, Esther returned to the cult. Eventually the cult traveled to Seattle, Washington. Esther's brother, 23-year-old George Mitchell, came looking for her. When he found her, he tried to convince her to come back to Portland with him. But she refused. George was convinced that his sister had been brainwashed. So he went looking for Franz Kreffield. He found Franz walking with Maud in the business district. He walked up behind him and shot him in the back of the neck. Franz, who was believed to have been about 26, died within minutes of being shot. Afterward, George lit a cigar and waited for the police. He was arrested and in custody, he said they killed Franz for ruining his two sisters. George Mitchell went to trial in July 1906. Several witnesses testified that they saw him shoot Franz. George also admitted that he killed the cult leader and he explained that he did it because he was protecting the honor of his sisters. The jury deliberated for 90 minutes and they found him not guilty. On July 12, 1909, the day after George was acquitted, he was at the train station in Seattle waiting for his train to Portland. With him at the train station were his three brothers and his 19-year-old sister, Esther. As he was getting ready to head for his train, Esther pulled out a gun, put it to George's head, and pulled the trigger. 23-year-old George Mitchell died instantly. Esther was arrested and confessed she killed George to avenge the death of Franz. Maude had purchased the gun for her and they plotted the murder together. So Maude was arrested as well. On November 16, 1906, while awaiting trial, 26-year-old Maude Creffield was found dead in her jail cell. The cause of death was strychnine poisoning. 
Her death was ruled a suicide. In February 1907, Esther was committed to a psychiatric hospital. She was released in April 1909 and went to live with her parents in Waldport, Oregon. In 1914, Esther got married. A few weeks later, on August 1, 1914, Esther died by suicide. She had ingested strychnine. She was just 26 years old. Number 1. David Burke On December 7, 1987, Pacific Southwest Airlines Flight 1771 took off from Los Angeles International Airport at 3.31 PST. It was supposed to land at San Francisco International Airport at 4.43 PM. It was a daily flight for the airline and it was rare for something unusual to happen. The plane was a four-engine British Aerospace 146-200A. That day, there were 39 passengers and five crew members on board. About halfway through the flight, a mayday call came from the plane that said there was gunfire on board. At 4.15 p.m., radio contact with the plane was lost. From about 22,000 feet, the plane had taken a nosedive. It had crashed into a hillside on a cow ranch about 15 miles northwest of San Luis Obispo, California. All 43 people on board were killed. Investigators read the passenger list and one name stuck out to them, David Augustus Burke. Burke was born in May 1952 in Britain to Jamaican parents. During his childhood, he moved to the United States. Around 1972, Burke got a job with U.S. Air in Rochester, New York. He was repeatedly investigated for being part of a drug smuggling ring that brought cocaine from Jamaica to Rochester. Burke had purchased a house in cash and he supposedly bought a $100,000 Mercedes-Benz in Germany and he had it shipped to the United States. Burke had also been investigated for auto theft. But well, the police never found enough evidence to charge him with anything. Burke never got married, but he had seven children with four women. In 1982, Burke transferred to Los Angeles, California. Burke had more problems there, and he often clashed with his supervisor, Raymond Thompson. At one point, Burke was suspended, but it's not clear why he was suspended. He returned to work after a grievance hearing and he was given back pay for the time he missed. Burke, who was black, accused Thompson, who was white, of being racist when it came time for promotions. Burke felt he had been passed over for three promotions in favor of white employees. Also, the rumors of Burke being involved in drug smuggling followed him to Los Angeles. Then, in November 1983, a hidden camera recorded Burke stealing $69 worth of flight cocktail receipts. On November 19, 1983, about three weeks before the crash, Burke was fired. He begged for another chance, but his pleas fell on deaf ears. He met with his supervisor, Richard Thompson, several times. The last time they met was on the day of the crash. Thompson had no intention of hiring Burke again. Burke knew that every workday, Thompson flew from Los Angeles to San Francisco, where he resided. Burke had not handed in his credentials, so he bypassed the security and he brought a 44 caliber Magnum and six bullets onto the plane. Then, about midway through the flight, it's believed that 35-year-old David Burke shot 48-year-old Ray Thompson twice. Then the co-pilot, 48-year-old James Nunn, called in to air traffic control to report the gunshots. The investigators reviewed the cockpit voice recorder. They heard the cockpit door open and one of the flight attendants, 37-year-old Debbie Neal, said, We have a problem. The 43-year-old captain, Greg Lindemood, asked, What's the problem? Then, there was a gunshot. 
Investigators believe that Berg shot Neil. Then Berg said, I'm the problem. This was followed by two more gunshots. It's assumed they shot Captain Linda Mood and the co-pilot, 48-year-old James Nunn. Seconds later, there was another gunshot. It's believed that Berg shot 41-year-old Douglas Arthur. Arthur was a pilot, but he was flying as a passenger on that flight. It's believed he may have been trying to get into the cockpit to make sure the plane didn't crash. Among the wreckage, the police found the Magnum revolver and six spent cell casings. They also found a note written on an air sickness bag. It read, Hi Ray, I think it's sort of ironical that we ended up like this. I asked for some leniency for my family. Remember? Well, I got none, and you'll get none. It's suspected that Burke gave the note to Thompson before he shot him, but anyone who knows for certain is dead. Some people who didn't condone Burke's actions understood his desire to get revenge on his former boss after getting fired. But what is less understood is why David Burke chose to kill 41 innocent people in the process. Number 3. Lori Palmer In autumn 2000, 39 year old Lori Palmer lived in Wichita, Kansas. Lori's best friend was a woman named Kayleen Phillips. They had known each other since they were children. When Kayleen married her husband, Scott Phillips, Lori was a bridesmaid. Lori worked as a police officer and at times she had to work nights. On those nights, her daughter would stay over at the Phillips home. In the fall of 2000, Lori was retired from the police department. One day, she was talking to Kayleen. Kayleen confided in her that she caught her husband, Scott, having sexual conversations with a young girl online. Lori then became suspicious. Her daughter had stayed over at the Phillips home. Did Scott do anything to her? So she asked her daughter, who is now 12. Her daughter said that four years earlier, Scott had sexually abused her when she slept over. Lori's immediate thought was to kill 41-year-old Scott Phillips. Scott and Kayleen had two daughters, and Lori thought they may have also been victimized. She thought that it was possible that the abuse was still happening. Also, Scott was talking to a young girl on the internet, so Lori thought that other children could be in danger. Lori thought that if she killed Scott, she would eliminate him as a danger, and her friend would get the life insurance payout. But Lori decided to report Scott to the police. They told her to fill out a report, and they would investigate. This wasn't good enough for Lori. She expected them to go out and immediately question Scott. So she left the police station and drove to Scott's workplace. She had her gun and her police badge with her. She convinced Scott to get into her car. Lori then raced at a high speed to a wooded area outside of town. She then marched Scott into the woods. She then ordered him to strip. Scott told Lori that he was a very sick man. He then confessed to sexually abusing Lori's daughter. Lori then let him get redressed and she drove him to the police station. Scott then confessed to sexually abusing Lori's daughter. He was subsequently charged with rape. The police and the district attorney were not impressed with Lori's actions especially since she was a retired police officer. She knew that if she reported a four-year-old crime, an arrest wouldn't happen within 45 minutes. Instead, she decided to take the law into her own hands. So they arrested Lori and charged her with several crimes, including kidnapping with intent to commit first-degree murder. Lori thought that she was innocent of that charge because if she wanted to kill Scott, she would have. After they were arrested, Scott's bond was set at $50,000 and he paid it. 
so he was released and stayed out jail while he awaited trial. Lori's bail was set at five times the amount of Scott's. She couldn't afford it, so she stayed in jail. On May 9, 2001, Lori Palmer pleaded guilty to kidnapping Scott. She was given 12 months of probation. Scott Palmer went to trial that same month. He was found guilty of aggravated indecent liberties with a child. But his conviction was overturned because the jury was given improper instructions. In July 2001, he pleaded guilty to the same charges. He was sentenced to four years of prison. Number 2. Marianne Bachmeyer Lübeck is a city in North Germany famous for its brick Gothic architecture. In 1980, it was home to 30-year-old Marianne Bachmeyer. She ran a pub and she was a single mother to a 7-year-old girl named Anna. Marianne had a tough life growing up. Her father was a former Nazi soldier. After the war, he was an alcoholic who ruled the house with an iron fist. When Marianne was 16, she became pregnant. She gave up the girl for adoption. When she was 18, she became pregnant again. While she was pregnant, she was raped. She gave up that daughter for adoption as well. In 1973, when Marianne was 23, she gave birth to a third daughter, Anna. She decided to keep Anna and raise her. On May 5, 1980, seven-year-old Anna got into a fight with her mother. She ended up skipping school to go see a friend. That afternoon, Anna didn't return home. Hours after she should have arrived home, a call came into the police. The woman said that her fiancé, 35-year-old Klaus Grabowski, had killed a little girl. Grabowski was a well-known sex criminal. In 1973, he was put on probation after attempting to strangle a six-year-old girl. Two years later, he was committed to a psychiatric hospital after being convicted of molesting a boy and a girl who were both nine years old. To curb his urges, he volunteered to be castrated. He was released from the psychiatric hospital and he met a woman who had become his fiance. With the court's approval, he started to get hormonal treatment to increase his sex drive. After Grabowski's fiance called the police, he was arrested at a pub. He confessed to murdering seven-year-old Anna but he said he didn't sexually abuse her. He said that he brought her back to his apartment. He claimed that Anna then blackmailed him. She said she would tell her mother that he had molested her unless he paid her. He said he felt like he had no choice but to kill her. So he strangled her to death with her tights. He then put her body in a box and hid it near the banks of the canal. He returned a short time later and buried the body in a shallow grave. The police recovered the body, but they could not determine if Anna had been sexually assaulted. Marianne Bachmeyer was not only devastated by the loss of her daughter, but she was also deeply offended that Grabowski had blamed her daughter for the murder. She was profoundly insulted that he would even suggest that Anna had blackmailed him. Klaus Grabowski's trial started on March 3, 1981. The defense argued that the murder was the result of hormonal imbalance from his hormone therapy. On the third day of the trial, Marianne walked up behind her daughter's killer in court. She pulled a 22 caliber Beretta handgun out of her purse. She fired eight shots The 35-year-old Klaus Grabowski was shot seven times in the back. He fell to the floor of the courtroom. 
Marianne then said, I wanted to shoot him in the face. Unfortunately, I hit him in the back. I hope he's dead. Grabowski then died on the floor a few seconds later. Marianne surrendered without resistance. While in custody, she had to take a writing test. She wrote, I did it for you, Anna, and drew seven hearts. Marianne did weekly interviews with the magazine Stern in the lead up to her trial. She was paid a quarter million Deutschmarks for the interview, which is about 158,000 US dollars. She then used the money to pay for her defense lawyers. Marianne, who was bestowed with the nickname Mother Revenge, went to trial in November 1982 and it was a media circus. The defense argued that she was not guilty because she was temporarily insane. The prosecution argued that the shooting was nothing more than calculated revenge. The trial lasted three months and then the three judges deliberated for 28 days. On March 2nd, 1983, Marianne Bachmeyer was convicted of manslaughter and unlawful possession of a firearm. She was sentenced to six years in prison, but she served a little more than two years. She was released in June 1985 because she was deemed a suicide risk. Later that same year, she married a teacher. In 1988, Marianne and her husband moved to Lagos, Nigeria, where her husband taught at a German school. They divorced two years later, and Marianne moved to Sicily, Italy. Marianne was later diagnosed with cancer. Marianne Buckmeyer died from pancreatic cancer in Germany on September 17, 1996, at the age of 46. Number 1. Miriam Rodriguez Martinez San Fernando is both a city and a municipality in northeast Mexico. The city is only about 90 miles from Brownsville, Texas. The area has been devastated by cartel violence. It was the site of two brutal massacres committed by the notorious drug cartel, Los Zetas, which in English is the Z's. The Zetas started off as an enforcement arm of the Gulf Cartel. They were made up of commandos who left the Mexican army. They broke off from the Gulf Cartel in February 2010. The Zetas are known for their ultraviolet tactics and at their peak, they were considered one of the most dangerous drug cartels. Being known as the most violent and dangerous cartel is quite the title because the other cartels aren't exactly groups of choir boys. The first horrifying mass murder they committed in San Fernando happened in August 2010. They shot to death 58 men and 14 women, 72 people in all. They were undocumented immigrants from South and Central America. They were killed because they refused to work for the Zetas and they give money for their release. In April 2011, the Zetas hijacked several buses of undocumented immigrants. Many of the women were sexually assaulted. Some of the men were forced to fight each other to the death. The winners joined the Zetas and the losers were buried in unmarked graves. In total, 193 people were killed and buried in several mass graves. In early 2012, Karen Alejandra Salinas Rodriguez lived in San Fernando. She was going to school and she ran her mother's business which sold cowboy apparel. Her mother, Miriam, lived in San Fernando on the weekends. During the week, she worked in the United States as a nanny. Miriam and her husband were separated, but still married. On January 23, 2012, Karen was merging onto the road when two pickup trucks pulled up on both sides of her. They forced her over to the shoulder of the road. When she was stopped, several armed men got out of the trucks. They took Karen back to the home that she shared with her mother, Miriam. 
While Karen and her kidnappers were hiding there, her uncle's mechanic came over to fix a car. He had no idea Karen was being held hostage inside. They grabbed him and then decided to flee. The kidnappers contacted Karen's parents and demanded a ransom. They followed the demands and dropped off the money. But they never saw Karen again. Miriam asked for a meeting with a member of the Zetas. To her surprise, one of them agreed to meet with her at a restaurant in San Fernando. He claimed he didn't have her daughter, but he offered to find her for $2,000. When they met, he was wearing a walkie-talkie. Miriam listened to the chatter on the walkie-talkie and learned that the man's name was Sama. After the meeting, Miriam called Sama several times to see if he had any news about her daughter. After about a week, Sama stopped answering his phone. Other Zetas would call Miriam and tell her they just needed some more money. At this point, Miriam and her husband didn't think that they would ever see Karen again. But they sent the money anyways. After signing the last payment, Miriam made a vow. She was going to hunt down everyone involved with her daughter's kidnapping until the day she died. Miriam talked to the mechanic who was kidnapped with Karen because they had released him. He confirmed that Sama had been involved in Karen's kidnapping. Miriam then started looking through social media. One day on Facebook, she saw a picture tagged with the name Sama. She clicked on the photo and she instantly recognized Sama. He was posing with a young woman wearing a uniform from an ice cream shop in Ciudad Victoria. For several weeks, she watched the ice cream shop and then one day, Sama showed up. She followed him home and noted his address. She then posed as a government pollster and went door to door in the neighborhood. As she spoke to the people, she collected information about Sama. She then went to the police with the information she had collected. But she had problems finding someone who would help her. Finally, she came across a federal police officer who looked at what she had collected. He was impressed and he got a warrant for Samuel's arrest. But when they went to arrest him, he was gone. Miriam's son lived in Ciudad, Victoria. On September 15, 2014, her son happened to see Sama, so he called his mother and the police. Sama was arrested later that day. In custody, Sama confessed to kidnapping Karen and he gave up the names of some of his accomplices. This led to more arrests. One of the men who was arrested was 18-year-old Christian Jose Zapata Gonzalez. Miriam was watching and listening to Gonzalez being questioned. He seemed to be really nervous. At one point during the interrogation, Gonzalez said he was hungry. Miriam went into the interrogation room, gave him her lunch, and bought him a Coke. The officer asked Miriam why she did this, and she said he was a child and she was still a mother. Gonzalez then confessed to taking part in Karen's kidnapping, and they offered to take the police to a ranch. The ranch was the headquarters of the kidnapping ring. He said many of the bodies were still buried there. Miriam went to the ranch with the police. She found a scarf that she knew belonged to her daughter. The authorities found the remains of dozens of people buried on the ranch. But they told Miriam they did not find any of Karen's remains. This didn't sit well with Miriam, so she pressed the authorities to do more testing. They agreed and did more testing, and it turned out that Karen's femur was among the remains. This confirmed Miriam's worst fear. Her daughter was dead. After visiting the ranch on the first day, Miriam was being driven home. She passed a barbecue restaurant near the ranch's entrance. 
Miriam remembered eating there two days after Karen was kidnapped. She then remembered a non-encounter she had in the restaurant with a woman named Yuliva Yuliza Bedenkur. Miriam knew Bedenkur since she was a child. She had a rough upbringing. Her mother was a sex worker who had abandoned her as a child. Miriam used to give her Karen's old clothes. That day at the restaurant, Bedenkur was sitting at a table by herself. Miriam asked Bedenkur if she heard about Karen's kidnapping. Bedenkur said she hadn't. Miriam thought that this was odd because it had been all over the news. After visiting the ranch, Miriam became suspicious of Bedenkur. She went through Bedenkur's social media account. She learned that Bancourt had been romantically involved with one of the kidnappers. The kidnapper was in prison for an unrelated crime. For several weeks, Miriam waited outside the prison where the man was incarcerated. Then she saw Bancourt come for a visit, so she called the police. Bancourt was arrested. The police investigated her and learned that some of the ransom calls were placed from her house. For years, Miriam continued to track down people involved in her daughter's murder. She talked to the grandmother of one of the men and learned that he had become a born-again Christian. She started attending his church and when she found him, she had him arrested. Of course, Miriam knew what she was doing was dangerous, so she carried a gun in her purse. And even though she was taking on members of the most violent criminal syndicates in the world, she remained aggressive. Miriam spent a year tracking down one man who was a florist before joining the Zetas. She discovered he was selling roses on the border. One morning, she woke up and learned that he was working that morning. She didn't even change out of her pajamas. She threw on her trench coat and grabbed her purse which had her gun inside of it. She rushed to the border and found the man. He saw her and ran. 56-year-old Miriam chased after him and eventually caught him. She held a gun to his back and told him she would shoot if he moved. She held him there for an hour until the police arrived and arrested him. In April 2017, Miriam was tracking a woman who had worked with the Zaydas. In April 2017, she was working as a nanny. Miriam watched the house where she worked. When she saw an opportunity, she called the police. They arrived and placed the woman under arrest. As they were arresting her, Miriam ran towards them and stepped wrong. She ended up fracturing her foot. She was placed in a cast and was on crutches. Many people thought that Miriam was risking her life by taking on the Zetas. She said, I don't care if they kill me. I died the day they killed my daughter. I want this to end. I'm going to take out the people who hurt my daughter and they can do whatever they want to me. In Mexico, Mother's Day is May 10th. Miriam was once again living with her husband in San Fernando. On May 10th, Miriam arrived home at about 10.20 p.m. She parked on the street just outside of her house and got out of her car slowly because she still had a cast on her foot and she was using her crutches. Suddenly, a white Nissan pickup truck pulled up behind her and several armed men got out. Thirteen shots were fired, and Miriam was hit twelve times. Miriam's husband came outside after the gunfire had died down and found her lying on the road. Her hand was in her purse, next to her gun. Tragically, 57-year-old Miriam Rodriguez Martinez died on the way to the hospital. Her murder led to mass protests. Many people were inspired that she took on such a dangerous criminal organization that the police even feared. The police arrested two of the shooters and a third one was killed in a gunfight. 
All three men had escaped from prison just months earlier, in March 2017. They refused to say who hired them, but many believe that the Zetas ordered Miriam's death. Thanks to Miriam's work, ten people who were involved in the kidnap and murder of her daughter, plus the murder of dozens of other people, were arrested. Number 3. Marco Flores When Marco Flores was three years old, his mother left him with his 14-year-old brother, Oscar, in Metapan, El Salvador. She moved to the United States, and she said she would eventually send for him. Three years later, Oscar handed Marco off to some strangers who drove him north. They passed him off to people in another car. Marco kept getting passed off until he reached Mexico. Then he was put on a flight to Boston, Massachusetts. He was greeted there by his mother, whom he didn't recognize after not seeing for three years. Marco moved into his mother's apartment in East Boston. Marco's mother worked seven days a week cleaning offices. Two years after Marco arrived, his brother Oscar came to the United States. He also worked cleaning offices. 21-year-old Jamie Gandalis lived down the street from the family. He quickly became friends with them. Soon, he was babysitting Marco after school. When Marco was nine, he discovered Galdamas had hidden a camera in his room and recorded him while he was changing clothes. Then, when he turned ten, Galdamas started sexually abusing him. The abuse continued until Marco was 13 years old. The following year, Marco started experiencing panic attacks. Marco then decided to get physically fit and went to the gym often. Galdamas was still part of the family's life but Marco didn't associate with him much. Then May 2011, 17-year-old Marco wanted to make a video for a school project, but he needed a digital camera. There was only one person he knew with a digital camera, Galdamas. He went to his apartment and asked him if he could borrow the camera. Galdamas said yes and told him it was in a drawer. Marco opened the drawer and saw a picture of his young nephew sitting on Jamie's lap. Beneath that photo was a stack of other photos. Marco took the camera and left, but his mind couldn't stop stirring. He thought that Galdemus was sexually abusing his nephew. Not only that, but he thought that the other kids might be in danger. Marco had a pit bull, but his mother made him give it away. However, he stole the choke chain he used to train the dog. He took the chain and the camera over to Galdemus' apartment. Once he was inside Galdemus' home, he pointed the camera at him and started asking him questions. Galdemus then confessed that he had sexually abused Marco. Marco put the chain around Galdemus' neck. Galdemus seemed to accept what was happening. He asked Marco not to stab him because he thought it would be too painful. Marco then had him sit in a chair in front of a mirror. He then put duct tape around his wrist and wrapped duct tape around his head. He then pulled on the chain until 27-year-old Jamie Gundelman stopped moving. Marco recorded the murder. Once Gundelman was dead, Marco moved his body onto the bed. He sprayed lighter fluid around the apartment. He collected the camera in Gundelman's computer and left. He returned the next morning and threw a match into the apartment from an open window. He waited to start the fire because he wanted to make sure that the other residents of the building were awake and could get out of their apartments. Afterward, he went home. He confessed to his mother and his brother Oscar. They suggested they turn himself in, so he did so. 17-year-old Marco Flores told the police about the abuse and how he thought Galdamas was abusing his nephew, so he killed him. He handed over the video camera where he recorded the confession and the murder at the computer. Marco was charged with first-degree murder. After all, Marco had planned out the murder and then covered it up. The police searched Galdamas' computer and found hundreds of photos of preteen boys. They also found 50,000 encrypted lines of chat in which Galdamas talked about grooming and abusing children. 
He also talked about some children he knew and wrote there were some good ones coming up. One of those kids was Marco's nephew. Two years after the murder, in May 2011, 19-year-old Marco Flores took a plea deal. He pleaded guilty to manslaughter and he received 15 years of prison. The judge gave him 15 years because he said the court would not tolerate vigilante justice. Four years after Marco was sent to prison, he was interviewed by a reporter for the Boston Globe. Marco said, Killing someone is never worth it. But I don't feel bad for him. I feel he was a very bad person. It's not like he tried to seek help. He chose to do it. I'm not saying I don't have remorse, but I don't feel sad for him passing away. Margot Flores will most likely be released in 2025. He'll probably be deported to El Salvador. He is serving a sentence at the Sousa Baranowski Correctional Center in Shirley, Massachusetts. Number 2. Aaron Vargas Fort Bragg is a small city on the coast of California. It was home to 31-year-old Aaron Vargas. In February 2009, things seemed to be going well for Vargas after several rough years. He was engaged and he had a six-month-old daughter. He was just weeks away from getting married. But for years he had suffered from bouts of depression. He would binge drink and he was arrested several times for DUI. He also had problems holding down a job. Several times he moved away from Fort Bragg. When he moved, he did well. But then something would happen and he would move back home. Daryl McNeil was considered a pillar of the community. The 63-year-old husband and father owned an appliance store. He was a mentor with big brothers and big sisters. He was also a Boy Scout leader. On February 8, 2009, 31-year-old Aaron Vargas was drinking beer and vodka. He got a Civil War replica pistol and drove over to McNeil's mobile home. McNeil answered the door and Vargas shot him in the stomach. McNeil's third wife ran into the room and recognized Vargas. He told her not to call 911 until after he left. He then told McNeil's wife that McNeil had been abusing him since he was 11 years old. Once he watched the 67-year-old draw his last breath, 31-year-old Anthony Vargas left. He then drove to his parents' home. For the first time, he told his parents about the abuse. McNeil had been their neighbor for years and Vargas had been close friends with McNeil's son. The first time the abuse happened was on a camping trip when he was 11. Vargas said that the abuse had continued into adulthood. He said that even when he would leave town, McNeil would track him down and stalk him. He told his parents that McNeil would give him odd jobs like delivering furniture. He would then give him drugs and alcohol and have sex with him. Sometimes he was unconscious when this happened. Recently, McNeil had been calling him daily. Sometimes he called him up to 30 times a day. McNeil would show up at his house unannounced with diapers and offer to babysit. Vargas claimed that when he went to McNeil's home, he didn't plan to kill him. He just wanted the torment to end. Hours after the murder, Vargas was arrested. After the murder hit the news, about a dozen men in their 30s and 40s came forward and said that McNeil had abused and stalked them as well. One of those men was McNeil's stepson. After McNeil's second wife, who was the man's mother, left McNeil, she tried to report the abuse to the police. But the statute of limitations had run out, so McNeil wasn't charged. Several other people had reported abuse at the hands of McNeil over the years to the police. But the police couldn't locate the victims, or the statute of limitations had run out. One question many people had was how did McNeil have control over Vargas even as an adult? Forensic psychiatrist Dr. Michael Wellner said, you take someone who is vulnerable and you get them formative and you attach them all through their development and you get in their DNA. And that's how you have people who even in adulthood are doing things totally unacceptable to them and yet at the same time they're powerless to break away from it. 
Many people in Fort Bragg supported Vargas. There was a petition requesting leniency and thousands of people signed it. There were also fundraisers, including spaghetti dinners, to raise money for Vargas' defense. A surprise guest at the first fundraiser was McNeil's third wife, who was there when he was shot to death. She also wrote a letter to the prosecutor. She defended Vargas's actions, writing, I do believe that something having to do with Aaron's childhood sexual abuse caused Aaron to snap and do what he did. In March 2010, Aaron Vargas pleaded guilty to voluntary manslaughter. The prosecution wanted Vargas to be punished harshly. A probation officer testified and recommended that Vargas get 21 years of prison, which was the maximum. He believed that Vargas and McNeil had a consensual relationship as adults and murdered Vargas to cover it up. However, a psychiatrist testified and said that it was clear that Vargas had been abused for years. The judge said he could not be lenient. He said the circumstances support the conclusion the defendant intended to kill the victim and the method was intended to make the victim suffer. Also, he couldn't give him just probation because it would be a stamp of approval of what he did. He said that Vargas should have let the legal system do its job. Aaron Vargas was sentenced to nine years of prison. It's unclear what happened to Aaron Vargas after he was sentenced, but he could have been paroled after four years. If he had served his entire sentence, including time served before pleading guilty, he would have finished his sentence in early 2018. Number 1. Clark Fredericks In June 2012, 68-year-old Dennis Pegg lived alone in Stillwater, New Jersey. Stillwater is a small town with a population of about 4,000. Pegg was a veteran who had served in Vietnam. For 28 years, he worked as a correctional officer and then seven years as a park ranger. He was also a Boy Scout leader between 1973 and 1980. In 2012, he was the president of both the Historical Society of Stillwater Township and the Sussex County Historical Society. Pegg was a member of the NRA and a weapons expert. Pegg loved to birdwatch and started the Sussex County Bird Club. He was also known to help hikers on the trails near the town by giving them water and food. He was considered a good neighbor. He'd pay neighborhood boys to mow his lawn. Peg never got married and didn't have any children. On the night of June 12, 2012, 68-year-old Dennis Peg was home alone watching ESPN. The next day, a town councilor called the sheriff's office and asked them to do a welfare check on Peg. Officers went there and found blood in the doorway. They got inside the house and found the dead body of Dennis Pegg in a pool of blood in his living room. He had been stabbed 30 times in the chest and his throat had been slit. The police made an arrest that afternoon. The reason the counselor had called the police was because a woman called her because she was concerned about her son, 46-year-old Clark Fredericks. Fredericks had come home around 2 a.m. covered in blood, but it didn't appear to be his blood. However, he did have some cuts on his hands. She wanted him to go to the hospital, but he refused. Instead, he took some sleeping pills and went to bed. In custody, Frederick said that Peg got what was coming to him, and he was a child molester for years. Fredericks explained that Peg was a family friend and had visited his family frequently. Peg even lived with Frederick's family after he was injured in a car accident. Peg was also Frederick's scout leader. Frederick said that between the ages of 8 and 12, Peg had sexually abused him. Peg also told him he sexually abused other boys. One boy was a friend of his, only known as Jeff. Jeff ended up taking his own life in 1983. Frederick said that Peg used to intimidate him into keeping quiet. He once beat up a dog in front of him and told him to keep quiet. Frederick said that he kept the abuse secret up until the night of June 12, 2012. That night, he and his friend, 46-year-old Robert Reynolds, were drinking and doing cocaine. 
Frederick started talking about the abuse and they decided to go kill Peg. Reynolds drove Fredericks to Peg's home. The front door was unlocked and the two men walked in. Frederick said that when he stabbed Peg, he repeatedly said, How does it feel raping little boys now? When he was done stabbing him, he slashed his throat. Reynolds watched from the front entrance. Robert Reynolds was arrested later that day. Both men were charged with first degree murder. After the murder hit the news, other men came forward. They had similar stories of sexual abuse at the hands of Peg. The police acknowledged that people had made allegations against Peg decades ago. But he was never arrested because people recanted their accusations. In the early 1980s, the police investigated Peg for two years, but they could never come up with enough evidence to charge him with anything. After his murder, the police found child pornography on his computer. Several people reported that Peg had a box with Polaroid photos of boys he had abused. The police did find a box of photos, but none of the photos were considered pornographic. After Clark Fredericks was arrested, he was evaluated by psychiatrists for the defense and the prosecution. Both psychiatrists concluded that Peg had sexually abused him. Clark Fredericks sat in jail for three years, awaiting his trial. He ultimately agreed to a plea deal. He pleaded guilty to passion slash provocation manslaughter, which came with a sentence of five to ten years. At Frederick's sentencing hearing in December 2015, he admitted that he didn't handle the situation properly. He said, I don't recommend that anyone follow in my steps. No matter how painful it may seem, I urge everyone to speak out about the abuse. The district attorney read a statement for Peg's family. They admitted some wrongdoing on his part, but he never had a chance to defend himself against the accusations. They said that Fredericks was, quote, a self-appointed judge, jury, and executioner. You chose to savagely end his life with your unlawful action. Ironically, you asked for justice only after you killed the person you say harmed you, unquote. Then the judge handed down his sentence. He actually said sorry to Fredericks that he had to send him to prison. He gave him the minimum, which was five years of prison. Since he had already served three and a half years, he would only have to serve nine months before he was eligible for parole. Robert Reynolds pleaded guilty to third degree robbery and hindering. In August 2016, he was sentenced to four years of prison. He served a couple more months in jail and he was paroled. Clark Fredericks was paroled in January 2017 after serving four and a half years. When he got out of prison, he became a motivational speaker. Number three, unnamed father, Delhi, India. Chandu Nagar is Islam in Northeast Delhi, India. It was home to an unnamed family of eight. The 36 year old father of six made his living by selling hamburgers from a cart. They also rented out a room in their home to a 45-year-old man who also wasn't identified. The tenant was the father himself. He had two daughters who were married. The father of six and his wife received a shock in October 2014. Their 13-year-old daughter started getting sick in the morning, so they took her to the doctor. It turned out she was pregnant. They talked to the girl and asked how this could have happened. She said that two months earlier, she was at home alone. The 45-year-old tenant pulled her into his room. He bound her and raped her. She kept it a secret because the tenant had threatened to kill her father if she said anything. After learning about the rape, her 36-year-old father was obviously angry. He told the tenant to move out and get out of their lives, but he refused to leave and even taunted the father. This further outraged the father. On October 31st, 2014, the father told his wife and children to sleep in a bedroom on the main floor. He wanted to talk to the tenant on the second floor. The father cooked the tenant dinner. The tenant didn't know they put drugs in the food. When they were done, the father bound the tenant. 
He then put a towel around his neck and started strangling him. He thought he killed him, but they discovered he was still breathing. So he heated up a steel spatula on a burner. He then pressed the spatula against the man's genitals. He screamed, so the father stuffed the towel into the man's mouth. He pressed the spatula to the man's genitals again, and his body twitched. When he pressed the spatula to his genitals a third time, the man stopped moving. He realized he had killed the 45-year-old man who had raped his daughter. The father knew that he could get rid of the body and cover up the murder, or he could flee the area, but he decided to turn himself in to the police. Rape is a big problem in India, and it often goes unpunished. If someone is charged, it usually takes six or seven years for a case to go to trial. After the father turned himself in, his 32-year-old wife visited him in jail. She told the media, I only had a chance to see him briefly, and he told me he wanted to warn potential rapists that they could never escape justice. When the father was interviewed and asked if he regretted what he did, he said, I started thinking, what is the point of living this life if I can't get justice for my daughter? I do not regret that I took revenge of what he did. No record of what happened to the father after he was arrested could be found. However, if he was convicted of murder, he could have been sentenced to up to 25 years in prison. Number 2. Unnamed Father, Shiner, Texas, United States Shiner, Texas is a small town between San Antonio and Houston. Its motto is, the cleanest little city in Texas. In 2012, it had a population of just over 2,000. On the afternoon of June 12, 2012, 43-year-old Jesus Mora Flores was working on a family farm just outside the city. He had been hired to help with the horses. Just after 3.43 p.m., a 23-year-old man who lived and worked on the farm was barbecuing and caring for a horse. His five-year-old daughter had gone to feed the chickens by herself. Then another worker on the farm rushed to the man and told him that he saw Flores forcefully carrying his five-year-old daughter to an isolated area. The father ran to the area and heard his daughter screaming. Minutes later, the following call came in 911. Well, I can't deny one section, mercy. I do, I do have ambulance. Okay. I do have ambulance. This guy was wrecking my daughter and I beat him up. And I don't know. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Okay, okay. I need a ambulance. Can you help me? Yes, we're going to try to help you, but you got to give us directions to your house. I'm going to ask you to help. If I use the directions, I'll kill you. Okay, when you leave China, do you go toward Delta and then what road? No, never mind that. I'm going to try and load him up with the truck. The sheriff is there? Yes. Okay. The father, who was never publicly identified to protect his daughter's identity, discovered Flores on top of his daughter. He pulled him off and beat Flores in the head and neck with his fists. When the ambulance finally arrived, Flores was unconscious and his pants and underwear were pulled down. 47-year-old Jesus Mora Flores was pronounced dead at the scene. The five-year-old girl was taken to the hospital. The doctor concluded that she had been sexually assaulted. The police investigated the death as a homicide, but they didn't arrest the 23-year-old father. Flores had been an acquaintance of the father. He did not have a criminal record. The father was described as polite and easygoing. After the death of Flores, he was remorseful and distraught. The police ultimately decided not to press charges because, according to state law, the father was allowed to use deadly force to protect his daughter. In June 2012, the district attorney presented the case to the grand jury. The grand jury could choose to indict the 23-year-old man and he would go to trial for whatever crime they indicted him for. A recording of the 911 call was played and several people at the farm testified. This included the person who saw Flores carrying the girl to the secluded area. The grand jury came to the same conclusion as the police 
the father had the right to use deadly force. So he did not face any charges for beating Jesus Morao Flores to death. Number 1. Sarah Sands Sarah Sands and her five children moved into an apartment in Silvertown, a district in London, England. Not long after moving there, she befriended 77-year-old Michael Pleasted. Pleasted was known as a local character around the district. He ran a brick and brack stall at a local market. Sands thought he was a nice man and should bring him meals. In the autumn of 2014, Police did hired Sarah's 12-year-old son Bradley to work at the shop. Her 11-year-old twin sons, Reese and Alfie, also started hanging around with Police did. But after a few weeks, Bradley lost interest in the job and stopped working. Then November 2014, Sarah's twin 11-year-old sons revealed the Police did had sexually abused them. A week later, her 12-year-old son Bradley also said he had been abused by Police did. Sarah went to the police and 77-year-old Michael Pleasted was arrested. Pleasted was given bail and he was allowed to return home, which was a set of flats that neighbored Sarah's building. Sarah was outraged that the man who abused her sons was allowed to return to live in the same neighborhood as his victims. She decided to move her and her children to her mother's home. She learned that Pleasted was going to plead not guilty, so her sons would have to testify he relived the abuse in court. Her sons already had nightmares about the abuse and she didn't want them to go through a trial. On the night of November 28, 2014, Sarah drank two bottles of wine and a bottle of brandy. She then went over to Pleasted's apartment. Sarah said when he opened the door, he smirked at her when he saw her. She told him to plead guilty to spare her sons the trauma of testifying in court. Police did apparently said that the boys were lying and they had ruined his life. Sarah then pulled out a 12 inch kitchen knife from under her clothes. She said there was a struggle and she ended up stabbing the 77 year old man eight times. Hours later, 32 year old Sarah Sands turned herself into the police and confessed. The police found police did dead in the hallway of his flat. The investigators called the death a determined and sustained attack. Sarah Sands was charged with murder. She was jailed for 10 months until she went to trial in June 2015. During the trial, it was revealed that Michael Police did was not the man's real name. He had changed his name. He was Robin Mould and he had a disturbing criminal record. Between 1970 and 1991, he racked up 24 convictions for sexual offenses. This included charges for indecent assaults on boys under 14 and 16. He received jail sentences between 9 months and 6 years. Sarah Sands was ultimately found not guilty of murder, but she was found guilty of manslaughter by reason of loss of control. She was sentenced to 3.5 years of prison. Including time served, she could have been released after 11 months. The case was referred to the Court of Appeals by the Attorney General because he thought the sentence was unduly lenient. The court agreed and more than doubled Sarah's sentence to seven and a half years. She ended up serving nearly four years in prison and was released in August 2018. In November 2022, Sarah and her three sons were interviewed by the BBC. Alfie and Reese were 19 and Bradley was 20. Sarah said she was remorseful for killing police dead. She said, I bring life into the world. It never occurred to me that I would be guilty of taking life out of the world. About the killing, Alvy said, it didn't make us feel safer. It didn't slow down the nightmares. The boys initially regretted telling their mother about the abuse. Bradley said if we had kept our mouths shut, we would have had our mom, but we would have been going shopping, going to the cinema, doing what a normal 12 year old would do. However, they know it's important for victims to come forward. Reese said it's going to be hard, but it does get better. Alfie added, you should always come forward. It's better to talk. If you don't, it's just going to get worse. Thank you so much for watching today's video. 
Please don't forget to check out our new channel, Paranormally Listed. There's a link on the screen now, and there's a link in the description box below this video. Well, that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.